just like to mention for those who are trying to view this live on uh, cable 15, the screen may be black uh, where the video equipment is currently not working, but you will be able to hear us. And they are recording this separately, so when it, there is a replay on cable 15, it will, you will see, see and hear us together. All right, first on our agenda, are, we have two appointments. Mr. Mayor, these are your appointments. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I have two uh, reappointments uh, this evening. Uh, and I do not know if they're in the audience, but uh, Geraldine Steffens Gunn to the Planning Commission. And uh, I know Mr. Ralph is here, James Ralph from the uh, Downtown Development Authority. Uh, I'm requesting that you uh, reappoint uh, both of these uh, individuals as they're doing an outstanding job. Mr. President? Yes. I'd like to move the reappointment of Geraldine Stevens Gunn to the Planning Commission and reappointment to the Downtown Development Authority, Mr. Support. James Ralph. It has been moved by Councilman Cruz, supported by Councilman Brightwell for the reappointment to the Planning Commission of Dr. Gerald Stevens, Stevens Gunn and the reappointment to the Downtown Development Authority of Mr. James Ralph. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. And we will now ask um, the clerk. We'll have you uh, re sworn in. <laughs> Madam Clerk. <laughs> <laughs> President. Yes. Can we just also acknowledge Mr. Ralph? He has his granddaughter and great granddaughter here with him today. Oh, wow. I just wanted to acknowledge them as well. Thank you. Next, we have our communications. The Southfield City Council has established the following rules of procedure for all speakers. No speaker may make personal or impertinent attacks upon any officer, employee, or city council member or other elected official that is unrelated to the manner in which the officer, employee, or city council member or other elected official performs his or her, du her duties. No person shall use abusive or threatening language towards any individual when addressing the city council. Any person who violates this section shall be directed by the presiding officer to be orderly and silent. If a person addressing the council refuses to become silent when so directed, such person may be deemed by the presiding officer to have committed a breach of the peace by disrupting and impeding the orderly conduct of the public meeting of the city council and may be ordered by the presiding officer to leave the meeting. If the person refuses to leave as directed, the presiding officer may direct any law enforcement officer who is present to escort the violator from the meeting. Each speaker will have three minutes. First speaker is Charles Hicks. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor, Madam Clerk, Administration, and Southfield community. My name is Charles Hicks, longtime Southfield resident. About a week ago, 
a very close friend of mine had a medical emergency. Made his, his wife made a call to the 911. First responders came promptly and were very professional. I believe it's important to give accolades as equal as you sometimes you give criticism to things. And the, the receipt of service that he received, I believe, saved his life. So I, I've already contacted Chief Menifee requesting that those who came on site to support so that I can personally thank them. But I also want to know, for, for the community to know, how important that the services that Chief Menifee and Chief Barron are providing to our community are, are value added and much appreciated. The second item that I had was related to the sustainability survey. Um, there's gonna be a report that's gonna be presented this evening. I do wanna applaud the planning committee for bringing up that effort. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully, potentially volunteering to support that if there's any uh, constituent <coughs> opportunity. Um, I did have questions on the process on how it's gonna be communicated out to the public because I believe that this is a tool that will be value added, but it's only good as those who participate. So I'm not sure in the report if uh, an approach for how it's gonna be communicated and encouraged by the community to support that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Greg Keeler. Some kind of way I did not receive an answer from it and I said stated that it had been asked to you twice and I want to get clarity on it the answer I ended up getting was from somebody in the peanut gallery which had the whole thing wrong which the lawyer had to then come and explain that that was wrong that was not the question I asked and I would like to be you know when I ask questions be asked answered from you since this is your time for me to ask you questions and answer from you and not the peanut gallery to give me something off the wall and ridiculous that makes no sense. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rick Kino. Good evening. That's King, K-I-N-G. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I live in Villa Point. I've lived there for 31 years. <clears throat> and I use my bike to run errands as much as possible. And over the last many years, uh, some years, it's been a big improvement. Uh, but there's a ma many fails, OK? A couple places I go, Villa Point's at, uh, you know, off of Evergreen, south of 12 Mile. I go to the uh, Citizens Bank next to the Home Depot a lot, and I go to the Korean store there. And the problem is, I run into is that on that side of Southfield, there's a section of Southfield with no sidewalk. So, frankly, it's kind of humiliating. You know, I go to the bank, I want to go back down to the Korean store on the same side of the street. I have to get off my bike, walk over, walk over the grass, walk over the curb. It's very awkward. And that's just, there are many other places. And I'm just making an appeal that some of these fails get fixed because it would really make uh, Southfield better. We've got the nice, much nicer bike paths now. Um, and it would uh, improve connectivity for bicycle riders. <clears throat> That's all I have to say. Okay. Um, I, 
Oh, yeah, I'll just, you probably going to say the same thing. I um, through the chair, <laughs> where is this section along Southfield Road, please? It's a it's a place called Griffin Properties. There's a Arby's, and then mm -hmm. south of there, there, I think it's called Griffin Properties. In uh, front of Griffin Property, there's no sidewalk. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it building? Yeah, it's no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The what? There is. There is not. Thank you. Um, Mr. King, we are, we are aware of it and it's something that the city is actively trying to fix. But it does get, it, it does get more involved. <laughs> but we, it is something we are aware of. Thank you. Um, and then I'd like to ask, um, either through the city administrator or through our city attorney, if you can give a brief explanation of easements for, for the other speaker. At this time, or if if you don't mind, yeah, uh, this particular property, we do not have an easement or and or a right of way for the sidewalk. Over the years, it has been discussed with the property owner, and it's one of those you know that we probably need to come to the point to tie it to their occupancy or uh, buildings. It, once the street hits a certain level of sidewalk coverage the sidewalk should have to be put in. Right. And can you explain um, for Mr. Keeler what an easement is? An, e an easement, the, pri the private property owner still owns the property and a, a piece of infrastructure is installed. That could be a water main, that could be a storm line. In this case, we're talking about a sidewalk. They would still own the property, uh, usually does not disturb their real physical property. <coughs> So and right away, the public owns it in an uh, easement. A private property owner owns the, the uh, property. And the piece of infrastructure is installed on their property. OK. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Frazier. Isn't it also true on an easement, even though the property owner owns it, that they can't plant flowers on it? They can't use it because if the uh, uh, whatever it's a sewer or, or overhead lines or whatever is using that easement needs to tear it up that's they just go ahead and do it yeah the, if if you have a piece of property and let's say there's a storm water you can use it ab above ground uh, but you can't go in and dig it and build on top of it typically where we put these things they're they're within what we call a front or a rear or a side yard uh, build outline. Um, so the uh, property owner still owns it, they still get taxed on the property, but there's a, a public piece of infrastructure in there. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have presentations. Our first presentation is by our 19th district state representative. Has she arrived yet? Okay. Uh, we will come back. The next is a presentation regarding updates to the Sustainable Southfield Initiative and the Public Sustainable Survey. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Suzanne Hanna. I'm the Sustainability Planner here at the City of Southfield. Um, so I'm here to just do a brief update regarding our Sustainable Southfield Initiative. And uh, really, I'm here for support regarding our public survey that was recently launched. So just a quick recap, our sustainability journey for the sustainability team here at the city began with ICLEI, which was a non-governmental entity that provided a cohort-style sessions um, virtually for many municipalities to get together and uh, share their sustainability planning journey with each other and learn from each other and ultimately um, get information from the sustainability planning toolkit to create a sustainability and climate action plan. So as a result of that training, uh, we were advised to create a uh, informal board, if you will, to um, garner responses and insight regarding some sustainability topics that we plan to include in our action plan. So this includes uh, many members from the local to state and national members, um, and we meet bi-monthly to discuss the following 10 topics that we've identified 
um, which will be part of our sustainability action plan. Um, so in an effort to be transparent and provide better public education, we have, um, we've pretty much uh, revamped our website and our public education resources. Um, many of the things that we've had were outdated or um, just didn't, did not have um, credible sources. And we know in the age of social media and um, other news outlets, it can be confusing when people hear um, news that they think is the truth. So we have updated our website to include sources from educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, and governmental entities, um, as well as providing our own insight in our Southfield Source uh, newsletter. So every month we pick a topic and we help to educate um, internal staff on a variety of different sustainability topics that they can apply at home. So some upcoming projects that I'm sure everybody is aware of. Um, the Monarch Butterfly Sculpture is near completion. Um, so if you pass by it on Northwestern Highway, the, uh, the beautiful pavers have recently been installed in the last couple weeks. And um, I guess the, the final phase of the project would be installing the pollinator garden. Um, and we have a design from our consultant on that and we hope to um, have that installation soon. Um, another exciting project are the solar bollards that we plan on installing uh, just southeast of Red Pole Park. Um, we're working, uh, the city is part of a pilot study and we're working with um, the inventor of this technology from the University of Michigan to hopefully implement these uh, in September. And finally, we have, um, we've been approved to purchase these big belly recycling bins, and we're also planning to um, use this as a pilot study to purchase and locate these uh, bins and put them throughout the municipal campus and see um, if this is gonna generate more recycling efforts. Um, and if all goes well, we hope to implement more throughout the city. Uh, so we've been applying for grant funding to help um, with various sustainability projects. Uh, the Valley Woods Trailhead project uh, between Streamwood and Bell Road. Um, back in June, we submitted for the DNR Spark Grant and we hope to hear from them in September regarding um, whether we obtain funding or not. Um, the next project is the DTE Energy Foundation Tree Grant. Um, that was actually submitted just last week for a maximum amount of $8,000, and we hope to use that to purchase and plant um, more trees throughout our pathways and trails. And finally, we are moving forward with the Consumers Foundation <coughs> grant um, to hopefully complete uh, Dr. Hubert Massey's Tapestry of a Community. We have three more panels, and should we obtain this funding, it will help uh, fund that project. Now moving into our survey, um, so we've generated three separate surveys to um, obtain information and perspective on what people think about sustainability. Uh, the first one, um, employees were able to take back in October of last year. Um, we've actually generated the survey within um, you know, a few months time, launched it, gathered information, and we analyzed the results last year. We had 75 respondents take it from various departments. Um, this was completely anonymous, so everybody's responses, um, you know, we could not attribute them to a specific person or department unless they chose to identify themselves. Uh, there were a total of 15 questions, and the general impressions were overall positive. So sustainability is important to the city, region, state, and overall country. Um, more than half of respondents value all three pillars of sustainability, and the city of Southfield should develop a sustainability and climate action plan. So the next survey that um, I'm looking for support for um, is our public perspective survey. So uh, this was recently launched in July, um, and we hope to close it out in September. Um, and we wanna analyze the results this fall in conjunction with a separate survey that Lawrence Tech is um, working on as well, and that will obtain sustainability perspectives uh, from the students and staff at Lawrence Tech. You're probably wondering, why do we have three separate surveys? Um, so 
I believe that it's not a one size fits all with regards to um, sustainability. We had to tailor some questions to students and ask them whether or not um, sustainability was being incorporated in their curriculum. So that's the LTU survey. Um, the staff survey asked about, you know, how content they were working in, you know, their respective departments, whether or not our buildings needed updating, things like that. So the public survey is kind of a mesh of both of those things. And um, we hope to have these as appendices in our sustainability action plan. Um, so I guess I want it on the record that we are having this sur survey active currently, and we do have hard copies. So for anyone uncomfortable filling them out on their phone, they can <clears throat> contact the planning department and uh, we're happy to assist them um, in obtaining a hard copy. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Council, any, any questions? Councilman Banks. Thank you, great presentation. Where did you say this study will be posted and how can the community um, you know, be informed of it? Per the comment earlier this evening, that was one of our questions, is how can they view these results? So what we hope to do is to have all the results um, in a more visually appealing manner. So whether it's putting them in pie charts, collecting you know, multiple um, responses that are similar and making sure we weed those out and just really consolidating all the responses. So ultimately, it's gonna be available in our future sustainability action plan. Um, and we hope to have that published in the next year, year and a half. So um, it will be public, you know, everybody has a chance to access all the responses. And that's really the point of the surveys, uh, public transparency. So it's just gonna take a little while for us to consolidate the responses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Cruz. Uh, yes, I was, uh, two things I was just gonna say. What, number one was just, um, is the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion involved in any of this? So um, I've, uh, I know that they work on various events throughout the city, and I plan to dedicate a section in the action plan to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. So I think at some point I will reach out to them and make sure that they're included. Yeah, I would, I would hope so, since the, you know, the social component, we want to make sure we encapsulate all of that. Uh, I'm going to steal something from Councilman Frazier real quick uh, about the monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. Is there gonna be a park where they're gonna be real butterflies or is it just the monument or the statue of it? Cause he's been asking about that <laughs> for a number of years and uh, seemed like it'd be a good place to put it. We, we definitely hope that real butterflies are attracted to um, to the monument. So when we put the plantings in there, we. Uh, consulted with um, professionals or landscape architects um, to specifically put like certain types of wildflowers and milkweed to be able to attract the butterflies. So um, we can only hope that they visit our site. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great, thank you. All right. Councilman Hogue. Thank you, um, great presentation. If you haven't thought um, of including, can you think about including like the school system, how we can bring our students into our plan. I think um, council would be a great opportunity for us to bridge with the Board of Education as well as the students because let's start early. So I think we should somehow have a component to bring in the youth and the school system. Absolutely, actually uh, I can't recall what her title is but uh, we have a woman from Southfield Public Schools on our sustainability board, okay, great. and I've been communicating with her on how to, um, you know, provide input with, you know, the quality of life component for our sustainability action plan. And I also hope that Southfield Public Schools could be a Michigan Green School. Mm -hmm. So the state has a program called Michigan Green Schools where if they incorporate certain sustainability initiatives in their schools, like. Um, recycling or having an urban garden, they get points mm -hmm. and then they get awarded um, the title of a Michigan Green School. So that well, is maybe my we vision. we can help letting it be a part of their curriculum. Absolutely. You know? So I think we should definitely make that a part of our plan. Sure. So, thank I you. agree. <laughs> thank you. Councilman Brightwell. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm about to lose my voice, but thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> and I think I've probably heard about this a couple of times. 
but just for our general audience and also for the sake of uh, the individuals who might have heard it for the first time, what is the purpose of this sustainability survey and what is the desired end outcome and how will it be used? Sure. Yeah, the purpose of the sustainability survey is to establish a baseline perspective about what people know. Um, that's going to help us uh, generate the sustainability action plan. Um, so if we find out that people know a lot about sustainability, we can kind of skip the rudimentary definitions and things like that and uh, kind of have a more uh, robust document. Um, but also it'll help us in our public engagement sessions as well to, to figure out how to um, speak to people in a way that makes sense to them. And the desired outcome would be to um, just gather data and be able to put that as an appendice in the plan um, and have it as a public document so people can see what their neighboring perspectives are and um, have a conversation about it with their neighbors, students, um, colleagues, um, and hopefully, ultimately, um, just enhance the quality of life here based on everybody's perspectives. Thank you. Um, I did have, the only question I had is, you mentioned that you, residents can call to get a paper copy of the survey. Have you thought about maybe just having some printed out um, in Parks and Rec near where the, near the, for senior services, just so they can have it? As we know, a lot of the seniors do not, are not computer savvy. Absolutely. So. Yep, we can do that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Council? Great okay. presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very yep. much. Thank you. Um, has our 19th district state representative, I do not see her in the audience, but did I miss her? She, she arrived. Okay. We will continue on our agenda. The next is our consent agenda. Council, do you have any items that you would like pulled for further discussion? Councilman Frazier? I have three items I'd like to pull. Okay. Uh, item B. D and F. D and F. Okay. And I want to pull item K. Okay. So why don't we take these, why don't we go through these right now. Um, item B is the um, to authorize an agreement with the Anti-Defamation League of Michigan for use of the municipal campus. And we do have a representative from the Anti-Defamation League here. Yeah, I don't have any problem at all. In fact, I support the, the walk. What I want to uh, say out loud is uh, I hope the police are prepared to have extra police protection because when you listen to the news recently, there's been an awful lot of uh, uh, concern about uh, attacks against Jewish people. And uh, I don't want anything to happen in negative to happen in Southfield. I want it to be a successful walk, and uh, we can learn something from it. So I'll ask the representative from the ADA. I, I'm sure you've been in uh, contact with our the city about the different plans. I I have. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Fraser, for bringing that up. Actually. My phone is pinging, um, and I can't turn it off because there are swatting incidents all over the country this past weekend and for the last four weeks. And for those of you who know what swatting is, it's when somebody nefariously calls in um, a um, fictitious emergency so that law enforcement will send SWAT teams out. It actually, this, this, this group of swatting incidents started in Michigan on July 21st. There were no swatting incidents in the last several weeks here. Um, but you're correct, there are a lot of incidents of hatred. The swatting incidents, by the way, this, this weekend included um, houses of worship for African Americans as well as uh, non-Jewish, other non-Jewish uh, houses of worship, as well as community buildings. So you're right, the incidents of hatred against the Jewish community are, um, are rising, I would say, we're in good company with the people that support us in terms of uh, incidents of hatred towards other people that support us, including the African American community, the LGBTQ community, the Latina and Latino community. 
these are equal opportunity haters, so that's the bad news. Um, the good news is uh, Chief Barron has been very, very involved in this, as is Chief Menifee and other members of the Southfield team. Um, we also have um, support from um, the Jewish communal security team, Gary Sikorsky and the team there has, is, knows about the walk. And um, I think Chief Barron has said to me on more than one occasion, this is one of his favorite events. And so I know he is very well aware of the law enforcement connection to this. Yeah, I'm a, you know, uh, I have no problem with Chief Barron being on top of the game. Uh, I really said it out loud, so any of the bad guys that maybe listen to our program tonight, to let them know that we're, we're going to have a good one. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, I, I appreciate that very, very much. Um, I know that law enforcement doesn't give all their tricks away, but I do believe that this will be, um, there, there's a lot of people being brought to bear for this. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Okay, Mayor Cyber. Um, I'm glad you brought this up because we should announce for anybody that's listening um, the date and time. Uh, it's our Sunday, October 22nd at 1 p.m. And this is the I, I, this is something personally, and I'm sure the council uh, agrees. Something we're very proud to sponsor uh, this walk against hate. Um, so again, it's Sunday, October 22nd. This is the third year and uh, it's moved from morning to uh, 1 p.m. That's to be able to include people who have houses of worship that they want to attend in the morning. So we've moved it from the morning <coughs> to the afternoon. Okay. Council, any other questions? Is that starting here or City Hall? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or be here for yeah. now? Okay. It starts here in front of the uh, City Hall and then it walks around um, down Civic Center Drive and around down Northwestern Highway and cuts into the sort of, I would say, there's uh, businesses over by the new hotel Oakentown. and then. <coughs> the Oaken Town Square building. Yes. Red Pole Park, it's the loop we've used many times. Yes. This will be the third year we've done this. Great. Thank you. I'd invite anybody here who would like to create a team to go to ADL.org. Uh, well, no, to go to walkagainsthate.org front slash Michigan and sign up to walk, to be a friend, to come out and walk. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Oh, and I would mention, I'll take a point of privilege. I spoke with a woman named um, Ms. Perry today, and she gave me a lot of information, and I, I will say today what I said to her. Sometimes you make a phone call and you're asking a question and somebody doesn't know what, know the answer, and they say, I'm sorry, I don't know, but Ms. Perry, I think her first name is Vic, Vicki, she not only, she works for you, <laughs> she's really great. I, I would say not only did she say, I don't know, but let me, hold on a second, I'd like to find out, and she came back to the phone and told me exactly how to get to this, uh, this room. So um, I believe in, at, some man said accolades. I believe when accolades are, diver, uh, are, are needed, we should give them. So I give Miss Perry my snaps today. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, she's probably home listening. She, she lives across the street, so she's probably listening to this broadcast. <laughs> I'll let her know if she doesn't. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Councilman Frazier, then you had a question on the Water Leak Relief Program Annual Report. Yes. Um, I read the, the write-up, and it looks like we're prepared to uh, offset the Water Leak Program up to close to $74,000. Um, do we have enough water people already? Are, are we, uh, because that's practically the salary for a Another well, the one thing to remember is this is for a documented leak in somebody's home. Um, it's not for a bill they can't pay or other programs for that. And if the homeowner is in the position where they have a leak, they are required to repair it when we split half the cost. Um, and you're only able to use it once in your lifetime in that house. So we, you know, now that the program's been in, Place. We've seen this 
not as much money as it used to be, and we're really, with our new software, trying to jump on bills that are excessive to contact the homeowners that, you know, you may have a problem and you need to address it. Well, I got a yellow card in my uh, door uh, a week or so ago, and I called in, turned out, I didn't have a ground sprinklers on last year, but I did have one this year, and they were comparing uh, last year to this year's, and so it was just a, I mean, you're out of time game. So, uh, but the thing is, the water, even the, the leaks, we have to pay for the water. Mm -hmm. So we're absorbing the $74,000, even though it's spread around the city one person at a time, or two people, or 10 people, or whatever it is. Um, and it wasn't too long ago that we made a decision that we would take a look at, and I'm sure that it's in effect now where there are commercial businesses that sprinkle along with a, a, a they are using the sewer system, so why are we charging for the sewer part of that? So we keep absorbing things, and I think we need to keep, keep aware of how much money we're absorbing, because uh, we could go through our retained earnings pretty quickly if we keep um, paying for things that uh, we're giving, you know, we absorb it quickly. People that are causing the problem. Well, and it is reflected in the rates that is shared with other people. Um, you know, it's water loss or uh, forgiveness is calculated by OMB. So yeah, there, there is. A, in the realm of things, you're talking pennies to millions. So. Yeah, um, I know because it's been uh, over a number of years. My next door neighbor, he's moved and gone away. Next door neighbor wanted to have two meters on his house because he wanted to water his lawn, but he didn't want to be the sewer water. And when I would talk to him, and I had a friend such, uh, they would go, oh no, we can't do that because that's causing all the other taxpayers to pay for his water. But now we're making decisions for the uh, give away a whole lot more than you would ever, ever use the water as well. So, well, there is this program currently in place where anybody is given forgiveness just for water use. Um, we are developing that. Uh, I've been talking to other communities. What they do is they offset if you're water only, um, your water rate is far in excess of what normal customers would get, and that's a possibility. Okay. We're trying to even out in fairness. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I got my two cents worth in that. No, and I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Other, That's it. Any other questions? Since, since you're up here, do you want to explain the, this water relief program? Water relief program is, is if you have, a, if a resident reports an unusual bill and we go out and discover that they have a water leak within their house, like a leaky toilet. Um, we had one person who the plumber did a horrible job and it, it leaked all over the house. And you know some of these bills can be $1,100, $1,200. That if you apply, the city is willing, and you meet the criteria, the city is willing to forgive half of the bill. <coughs> And so if you had a $1,200 bill caused by the leak, you have to, number one, prove that you fixed the leak. Um, it's usually done by a plumber's invoice or whatever. And then um, we will grant you relief on half of it. But then again, you're only given that once in your residency in Southfield. We don't want reoccurring people, um, but we also don't want to burden those people, especially in older homes where things tend to fail. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then, Mr. Frazier, your last question was on the 2023 Consumers Energy Foundation Prosperity Award. Yeah. Um, the uh, application for the grant from the Consumers Power Company 
is for $125,000. They're going to give a maximum amount of $250,000. So we're going to apply for, we want to apply for uh, half of that. And my question, and that's to finish a piece of artwork that's been started but not completed. And my question is, what is the plan if we only get $10,000 or $50,000, but not the 125000 uh, This is uh, Tom Payson with City Planning, through the chair. My understanding is that the, the chance, if we don't get the full amount we need to do the work, that we'd be working through the Public Arts Commission and the City Center Advisory Board to raise you, the You want to go to the microphone so the yeah. people at home can... Sorry, I'll get a little closer to it. I, can, can you just oh, no. step over? All right, um, my understanding is the if we don't get the full amount, we would be working through the city center advisory board and the public arts commission to make up the difference. Uh, at this point, we think we're very competitive. This was the letter of intent. If we pass that phase, we'll be able to put in the full grant application. But given the nature of what they're focusing on, arts and culture in this round, we think we're pretty competitive on this. We have a shovel-ready project. It's two-thirds built. So we're, we're very hopeful. But you never know for sure. It's gonna, I'm sure it's going to be a lot of applications for this pot of money. But uh, yeah, we would be working through the city city and the South Hill Public Arts Commission to make that up if we don't get the full amount. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would hope that we're successful, but I bought a lottery ticket and I'm here tonight, so I didn't win. <laughs> so. I understand. But we figured, why not go for the grant and then use that? If we, do, if we get the grant, we can use that money for other things that was in the other board's purviews. It's more of a, it's not that we couldn't pay for the rest of it, it's like we'd like to use that money for more things. So we qualified, we met the criteria, so it was worth applying, especially since it was no match. If we get this money, there's no match. So it's, it was worth filling out the letter of intent to see if they would let us go to round two. But didn't I read in the write-up that uh, uh, you have to identify what you're gonna use the money for? Oh, absolutely, the letter of intent, we had to explain the project. Yes. So, yep. And it, we had to submit the letter of intent Friday because we had to be there in order to be able to apply for the grant later. You have to make it through the letter of intent phase. So this is the approval to apply for the grant if we make it past the letter of intent phase. <coughs> so, okay. And we Thank do you. have estimates for the work. We know kind of what it costs to do the last two phases, and we've got updated estimates from Dr. Massey and from the contractors who did the concrete pedestals. So we know that 125000 should be the right amount give or take a little bit. Okay, thank you. That's thank you. it. All right, and then Councilman Brightwell, you had a question on the proposed moratorium for alkaline hydrolysis. Yes, um, in essence, I just, I just want a clarification of what I'm reading. In reading this, uh, the statement is there's, there's no clear definition for the final disposition of human body. So I just want someone that's familiar with this to explain something to me what, what they're talking about. I can start, um, Councilman Brightwell. So in the public act, um, when they talk about death and a variety of things under the Criminal Procedure Act, they have a, de a definition that talks about final dis dis disposition of a dead human body. And they say that means cremation, burial entombment, or other method of final disposition of a dead human body allowable under law. So without going into details as far as what funeral directors, uh, as far as uh, what they do in that area of disposition of a body, the law still needs to oversee the proper uh, ways to dispose of a body. And with the new, um, I have to look at this again, the aqualine hydrolysis liquid cremation, that's not included in this definition. And therefore, for the city to be able to answer any question for someone that may be interested in doing this, whether it's where they want to locate a particular location, uh, I'm sorry, locate a particular business that deals with final disposition of bodies. This particular method is something that the state law does not address, and there may be reasons why. So upon talking with the building official, 
Uh, we want to do more research. It is, uh, as you see, it says allowable under law. So there are, I believe, 21 or 22 states that address it in their laws. But Michigan isn't clear. So it's still somewhat new, and we want to make sure that we have a clear understanding before someone comes in, as, or someone has come in, actually, and said, I want to have this type of business. I want to have it on this part of the city. But we need to look at everything because we don't want the state coming back and saying, what are you doing, Southfield? We've determined this isn't a final disposition of the body, so what are you doing with this body or bodies? So that is why um, we talk about the definition because there is no definition of this type of final disposition of a body. Um, some people may think it's cremation, but under that statute, cremation is incineration. So we want to make sure that we have a clear understanding, you know, what the state really uh, wants us to do if we should allow this type of business in Southfield. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Council, any other questions about our... All right. So under our consent agenda, we have item A, which is location change for our, our October 10th, 2023 council mm -hmm. meeting to Lawrence Tech. Item B, the authorization to authorize an agreement with the Anti-Defamation League of Michigan for the use of the <coughs> municipal campus for the walk on Sunday, October 22nd. Item C, authorization to renew the auto body repair services for the motor pool. Item D is to accept and uh, receive and file the water leak relief program annual report. Item E is an authorization to renew contract for manage assigned council coordinator in accordance with the Michigan in Indigent Defense Commission grant. Item F, authorization to seek the 2023 Consumers Energy Foundation Prosperity Award. Item G is a liquor license request for SNZ investment DBA Fuddruckers at 25309 Evergreen Road. Item H is a liquor license request for Optimum Hospitality, doing business as Lily Mae's Southern Buffet at 29221 Northwestern Highway. Item I is a liquor license request for Edge River Farm at 23410 West 12 Mile Road. Item J is the purchase of remote radio control heads for the new County Motorola radio system. Item K is a proposed moratorium on alkaline hydrolysis. And item L is the Civic Center Island Paving. Mr. President. Mr. President. Yes. I move that we approve items A through J. L. A, Support. A through L. Support. Right, it has been moved by Councilman Fraser, supported by Councilwoman Taylor, to approve consent agenda items A through L. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have one ordinance to enact. Mr. President. Yes. I move that we enact ordinance number 1774. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Cruz, supported by Councilman Taylor, to enact ordinance number 1774, which were a number of zoning text amendments. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have our agenda items for discussion and or action. And the first item is the authorization to award a proposal to OHM Advisors for Professional Design and Construction Administration Services for the Reading Garden and Front Entrance Plaza at the Southfield Public Library. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I apologize ahead of time for my voice. So if you don't hear me, I'm happy to repeat anything. <clears throat> So as background in May 2021, the Library Board of Trustees approved funds from the Miller Trust Fund for a complete overhaul of the library's exterior landscaping and hardscaping. This esteemed, this esteemed body authorized OHM advisors to conduct phase one of the design and engineering work on this project. This included removing the brick pavers and installing new landscape for our reading garden off of our children's room, as well as the repairs in new landscaping on the evergreen patio and the library west edge. This project enabled our library to return to successful and very well received outdoor programming in both of these areas. So thank you. 
OHM has submitted a proposal to help us begin phase two of this project. The proposal is for the design and construction administration services to complete phase two. This would include removal of the pavers surrounding the library entrance and the path back to the evergreen patio. Also, replacing that area with decorative paving and furniture, both in that area as well as in our reed and garden. These improvements will increase safety in both areas, but they will provide the opportunity to provide even more expanded programming and greater use and enjoyment of both these areas by our community. OHM advisors have been working with the library on this plan, and they recommend progressing both of these projects in tandem. This will allow OHM and the city resources to be used most effectively and allow work for both projects to be bid in a single package. I have included a summary of OHM advisors' work to date and the proposed services included in phase two. I have also included the fiscal impact and timeline for both of these projects. The total fiscal impact of these projects being combined is $74,090. I would like to note the tasks identified at hourly not to exceed will be billed monthly based on the actual time spent and performed under the terms and conditions of the city's continuing services agreement with OHM. I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, Council, do you have any questions on this item? Okay, pretty simple. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair? Yes. I move the, authoriza the authorization to award the proposal to OHM advisors for professional design and construction administrative <coughs> Services for the Reading Garden and Front Entrance Plaza at the Southfield Public Library. Support. It has been moved by <coughs> Councilman Taylor, supported by Councilman Brightwell, to approve the authorization to award the proposal for OHM advisors for the design and construction of the Reading Garden and Front Entrance Plaza at the Southfield Library. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have a change of use for 29410 Northwestern Highway. Uh, thank you, Council. We've had a request from the property owner at 24 or 29410 Northwestern and his architect to come before you to discuss a, uh, a change of use proposal for this property. The reason they're coming before you is it doesn't actually need rezoning, but the site development standards for the use requires a 500 foot separation from residentially zoned properties. And there are two properties that abut that are residentially zoned, so we would have to consider some form of text amendment. Um, so they, they were gonna present their um, <coughs> concept to you, and then we were looking for some feedback from council on how we should proceed with, in terms of investigating options for accommodating the use if that's council's desire. Okay, so if you wanna just please give your name and address for the record. <clears throat> Hi, council members, my name is Luciano Del Signore and my address is 29410 Northwestern Highway. I've been the owner operator of um, Baco Ristorante since 2002. <clears throat> so, we're looking to make a, um, a sizable investment and remodel our entire property. We want to add an element of a cigar um, smoking um, facility in there, as well as maintain our fine dining dining room as a non-smoking dining room. So it's, we're looking to really build something extraordinary and which would be a, a beautiful addition and a great destination uh, restaurant for Southfield. I've been here now for approaching 22 years and I've loved doing businesses in this community and I want to continue going forward as um, it's, it's time to, to give this property 
uh, it's a, a proper facelift and launch it. And uh, I think that this would bring something very, very beautiful to the community. Right. Council, do you have any questions? Looks good. Yeah, <laughs> Looks um, <great. coughs> to, to the planner. Have we done this before? Uh, change, change the the uh, zoning to accommodate a, a different use? Uh, the zoning ordinances do get amended fairly regularly. I mean, we've been in front of you three times already this year for amendments. Uses in the economy evolve, technology evolves. Um, the codes are meant to be updated on a somewhat, <coughs> looked at and updated on a regular basis. In this case, it's just a question of, are there other ways to provide, uh, my understanding is one of the primary concerns was smoke from smoking lounges getting into other properties. And there may be ways to address that other than just a 500 foot property line to property line blanket prohibition, which is what's in the code now. Could be that it could be use to use. It could be that the smoke is only inside and they have to have enhanced ventilation and filtering like we require for marijuana facility facilities. There's a number of ways we could approach that if we wanted to entertain some way of addressing the potential nuisance issue without that blanket 500 foot separation between properties. Well, we've had uh, other uh, places that came in that wanted the smoking bar or cigar, or cigar bar mm -hmm. and uh, seemed to me that we were fairly strict on how they had to wash the smoke and, and everything to make sure that it didn't uh, leave the, <coughs> the facility and bother anybody else close by. So, yeah. but if we change if we change the zoning, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't stop the smoke from coming out. I mean, uh, it's got it's got to have uh, a way of treating the cigar smoke so that it doesn't uh, exhaust to the outside. Mm -hmm. So is, is, is there a conflict with the zoning plus the, the washing of the smoke? No, I think we could, we wouldn't, we would still try to address that potential issue with maybe a different, different code provisions like advanced filtering, airlock, not, no outside smoking. There are, the question is whether or not the 500 foot property property separation is the only way to solve that problem. And it's distance is a great like robust way to solve a separation issue, but it's not necessarily the only way it can be done. Like our marijuana facilities have to have actually advanced HVAC and filtration so you don't smell the marijuana outside of the facility. <coughs> if we can do that at a marijuana facility, it can probably be done at a cigar bar. Yeah, well, whatever we decide, whatever we decide to do ought to be the the best that is possible. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's my question. Thanks. Um, Councilman Taylor? Uh, yes, I just wanna say uh, thank you for being here 22 years in the city. Uh, Baco is one of the nicer restaurants that we have here in the city. And I understand that you want to evolve just like any other business. You're just Correct. trying to stay in business and you wanna stay here in the city of Southfield. And I fully support this 100%. Uh, uh, I think that I don't personally smoke cigars, but I know a lot of people that do, and they look for a quality place that have quality cigars and an atmosphere that, I mean, that would just attract business people and uh, just a comfort. And Baco could provide that uh, given the right uh, avenue. The air quality control was of concern until I spoke with uh, Mr. Payson. And like he said, they do have various ways of uh, filtering that smoke from the cigars. And it's not like uh, you're gonna have 50 people smoking at one time anyway, where it's full. Right. And you still have the restaurant on the other side. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that's great. And I comp compliment you for wanting to stay here in the city of Southfield. Thank you. I've, uh, <clears throat> it's, Southfield's been fantastic to me, that location. Um, I still believe is second to none in Southeast Michigan. I just, uh, I love that little part of our community and I think it's accessible from many, many communities. Mm -hmm. And I think we've always been a destination and I assure you we will spare no expenses in this renovation. And um, 
my uh, my comments to the um, the engineers for the um, heating and cooling and the exhaust was whatever you think it will be we're going to double it like we really want to make this facility among the best of you know of cigar bars that there ever was I I too am a, a, a an avid you know, enjoy a cigar from time to time, but I don't like smoking in a facility that's smoky. I want it to be, uh, I want clean air constantly moving is important to me, and we're not going to spare any expenses there. Thank you. We appreciate that. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Councilwoman Banks. Thank you. I, um, I was going to ask, do you know or can you explain what the, um, the air filtration system is? I mean, do you know it at this point? <laughs> Good evening, my name is Victor Sirocchi. We're the um, architects working with Luciano and um, we do a lot of hospitality work and restaurant work and um, uh, we will be introducing a state-of-the-art filtration system. And the filtration system is for cigar smoke is a little different than cigarette smoke, but um, it will be state-of-the-art and it will be completely filtered. And um, to add to what Luciano has said as well is um, the main dining room will be a smoke-free environment as well, so there won't be smoking throughout the facility. There will be areas in the facility that you could smoke and areas that will not allow smoking. But um, uh, it will be enhanced, it will be state-of-the-art, and um, uh, working with our mechanical engineers, um, they said we definitely can um, filter the system and provide a lot of fresh air as well. So we feel very comfortable that we can uh, manage this in a um, first-class manner. Thank you. And just the fact that your company is um, overseeing this project says a lot. You've done some beautiful developments thank you. throughout Oakland County. And to Luciano, thank you for being here for 22 years. I think this is an exciting um, new project for the city of Southfield. Um, in my family, the males all are in competition with the cigars, and it will be exciting to have them stay in Southfield because we don't have any, um, I guess you could say, cigar um, lounges in our city. So um, as someone who frequents your present location, we're really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Brightwell. Yeah, excuse my voice as I go along here, but um, I echo my uh, colleagues' comments about your, your uh, facility, and I've used it as, as a customer several times. Uh, how will this, and currently you are in an attractive facility in, in restaurant, how will this uh, enhance your attractiveness, and do you predict uh, what number will your um, clientele increase by that? Uh, we're hoping we um, <clears throat> we had a great run and still uh, are doing well but when COVID hit it did affect that fine dining level of restaurants I also own and operate Vita Laura Wood Fire Pacina which my first location was just two blocks down the street on Northwestern Highway and Franklin Road and Vita Laura because we already packed food in the paper didn't go through the same type of uh, uh, downturn that Baca did when the pandemic hit. And, uh, um, and coupled that with the office buildings around it and still aren't at 100% capacity, the, the restaurant is really good as a, as a business uh, dining facility for business meetings. And then important uh, you know, monumental anniversaries and birthdays and celebrations. And that's how we made it for the first 20 years. And now I think that 
Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Cruz? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I think they can put a place to do this. Uh, and you're right. It'll keep more people in the city. I'm tired of what Brian was going to do. To go out there and order food from fast food places to bring in and stuff. You know, you can go and spend yourself. You want to say that first. Uh, in fact, the first time I went to a restaurant, this lovely young lady took me. <laughs> and she said, you have been fine. I was like, you're gone. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful experience and has been since. So in terms of the, the air quality and all that kind of stuff, I'm not really concerned about it because I've been to places and I know that you can make the place you want to know they are in the whole place right. if you do it correctly. And so um, to be your time in our city and your business, I'm sure that's going to be the case here. Um, is there going to be a separate entrance into the cigar bar, or is it just going to be what's to do? We're still in design, but yeah, we're going to have all the other entrances to the building. Okay. Yeah. Are we working on the ships there? Is that you guys plan on doing some work? We're still working through a lot of those people. Okay, I'm, I'm jumping to get up. I guess I'm excited. <laughs>
we're a freestanding building. I, you know, we own the whole property. We're surrounded by uh, a fence, and I know that you know smoke is just. We can mitigate it that it's not going to be an issue for anybody in any direction um, for us. Okay, so I think the planning department has their marching orders. Yeah, as I understand, we'll uh, we'll get to work on that. Okay. Mr. President, if I yes. could just real quickly. Um, is it going to require any more parking than it is there now? Or no, the lounges have pretty much the same parking as a restaurant, so it wouldn't change their parking requirement. Oh, okay, great. Okay, cool. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. <clears throat> um, we all know that uh, Baco is an exceptional uh, restaurant. I applaud uh, Luciano for wanting to... Um, you know, from time, times change, you have to watch the market and certainly um, to reinvest, I think is very important to uh, the city. And beside him is one of Detroit's top architects. So uh, I have every confidence in this team. Uh, we wanna keep uh, Baco in this city and doing well, so. Um, I'm glad to hear the support uh, sounds unanimous from the council. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, council, any other further questions? It's part of our sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, council members. <clears throat> um, we are going to deviate and go back to our presentations. We have our 19th district state representative um, has arrived. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you again. For those of you who don't know me, I'm state representative Samantha Steckloff. I really apologize for being left. I thought we were on a 7.30 schedule, so I'm really sorry, but I'm here. I'm very excited to be with you today. For those of you who have not, I have not met you just yet. Um, again, I'm Samantha Steckloff. I came, come from Farmington Hills. I served on city council there for seven years, uh, from 2013 to 2020, when I resigned to take my role as state representative at that time for the 37th district, which was all of Farmington and Farmington Hills. So with the new lines, I'm proud to say that I now get to represent the beautiful city of Southfield. Um, I've known so many of you for so many years, uh, going back to our National League of Cities days, uh, way back with my good friend Jeremy Moss. Uh, he definitely helped me get my career started in local government, and so I'm proud that we get to work on so many things still together uh, by now encompassing Southfield. Uh, so with that, I wanted to give a little bit about my background. As I said, I have served in my second term in the state legislature. I'm in the 19th district, which is now northern Southfield. So I have northern Farmington Hills, northern Southfield, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, Franklin, southern Bloomfield, and a little bit of Birmingham because why not? <laughs> you know, we're at the point where these districts have become so sprawled that, that we're still all getting used to having so many cities com comprise our districts, which is great in many ways, but also difficult in so many others. Today is a prime example of that. Moving from one to two communities to eight has definitely have its challenges. Coming from city council, going from you know two full cities to three cities, two townships, three villages. It's it's very different. So we're learning and navigating the waters. But for the first time in over 40 years, um, the Democrats have taken control of the House, the Senate and the governor's office. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the things that we were able to accomplish in this year's budget. I serve on appropriations, so I am your budget person here representing Southfield. I serve as chair of higher education and community colleges. My entire background is in higher education. My first job out of college was at the University of Kansas. Got a promotion back at University of Michigan. And then I worked at Wayne State University as a manager of undergraduate admissions for many, many years. So I see the full struggle uh, that it takes to really not only get into school, but how do you manage through school. So the budget for higher education and community colleges really represents that for students and also for faculty and staff that work there. I serve as vice chair of joint capital outlay. And then I also serve on K through 12 
general government, which I have great news for all of you today about that, transportation, and I know I'm missing one, and I can't think of it for the life of me right now, but uh, that's where we're gonna start. So with K through 12, I wanna give a little bit of updates on our budget. Um, uh, we just passed our first budget of this year <coughs> for the new 102nd legislature. I am so sorry that I'm pulling this up. And some of the big investments we've really made um, you're going to see this upcoming year. So I first want to focus on K through 12. Um, we spent an additional $611 million this year to increase per pupil funding by 5%. This is the largest increase you will have seen this century. We have brought the per student pupil up to $9,608 and there's an additional $450 million deposit into the rainy day school fund. Um, we've put additional dollars, $370 million, into supporting our teachers, making sure that their lives are now livable with wages and increased support. For the first time in decades, we have finally closed this special education gap. You are going to see an additional five, $254 million to expand free pre-K, and something that I worked very hard on this year in this budget, and one of the things I'm most proud of is that for the first time, every single student who goes to public school in the state of Michigan will get free breakfast and lunch. Incredible, for $160 million, we're able to feed every single Michigander in public schools, and I just think with everything that we have been through these past few decades, it's an incredible feat to know that no student and child will ever go hungry in school. But not only that, think about all of the pressure we have seen through COVID put on parents. This is a great time where parents can now understand that their child is going to get a nutrition, nutritional lunch if they don't necessarily have the time to make it themselves. Um, when I say nutrition, that was a huge importance of this. We're really working with our agriculture community. You're gonna be seeing a lot of fresh from the farm to table, all options must be included in every public school, meaning there must be halal or kosher and even vegan um, must be provided. So really, really excited about that. Um, uh, additional improvements you're gonna see in higher in education is that we're going to be working a lot on um, English as a second language, uh, putting millions of dollars into helping people um, our immigrant population really learning uh, this, those very special skills. And then for higher education, you're going to see a 5% increase in operational funding for all universities and community college for the first time. Also, you're going to hear a lot of for the first times. If you are over the age of 21, I'm going to say that again, 21 and older, you are now eligible for free community college in the state of Michigan. With Reconnect and lowering the age of 21, we'll be able to get hundreds of new people through a college education. And this just isn't for an associate's degree. You can use this also for certification and for many of our jobs that might be changing in scope, this will also help you stay, um, stay, stay in course. Um, we're gonna be putting um, millions of dollars into additional dual enrollment programs, helping our students here get those college education credits needed at an earlier age to help cut down the cost. And then one of the things I'm most excited about is the Michigan Achievement Scholarship. The Michigan Achievement Scholarship is the first of its kind in the state of Michigan. This was first introduced this past year. We put an additional $50 million into this program. So when you fill out your FAFSA, Middle income. The middle class is finally going to see some help there with scholarships for our young students. So if you are making kind of the, the correlation between EFC, uh, expected family contribution, and maybe your household income, is if you're making about $80,000 a year, um, depending on if you have one, two, single parent, doesn't matter, uh, you will see free tuition and fees um, in any higher education learning. So this is a huge accomplishment for the state of Michigan. As I've heard, we see a lot today that we have a lot of needed facilities. We have a lot of needed jobs, especially in our engineering, a lot of these jobs that require bachelor's degrees. So this is just another way to get those students on track. You're gonna see a lot of improvements to road and bridges if you haven't already. We're putting another 100, uh, $450 million into our local roads. We're putting $80 million into additional 
bridge bundling. We're finally getting some rail grade separations fixed in southeast Michigan. Um, and you're also going to see a new pilot program called Vehicle Miles Travel. Yes, I come from city council, so I understand the need of Act 51 and how it must go through many changes. So one of the biggest things we're tackling this year is how do we create a new revenue stream for local roads? Um, and so we're looking at a vehicle mile travel study. This is a study that's been done in many states. Um, we currently have about 11 states that do this, anywhere from Virginia, Utah, Oregon. Uh, so many things that we're working with the federal government on. So this is a way to really kind of balance that gas tax out with electric vehicles. We keep hearing EV vehicles are going to be here in majority vehicles by 2040, and this is a way to help make sure that local governments can pay for their roads. So moving away from a gas tax and predominantly hopefully going through this new model. Again, this is a model, so we'll have lots of discussions. Um, we are going to see a lot with revenue sharing, which I'm very, very excited about. Let me skip down to that. You're going to see a 2% increase in revenue sharing and an additional, I believe it's 5%. I probably shouldn't be on television saying this because you're going to quote me, but I believe it's 5% increase um, for your public service, uh, public safety. So fire, police are going to see an additional revenue sharing increase. We're working on a trust fund right now, a revenue sharing trust fund to make sure that no matter who is in charge, um, our local communities will always have the funding necessary to provide essential services. So those are a few of the budget updates I wanted to present to you, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. I know I'm in the middle of a meeting. Again, I really apologize, everyone, um, for being so late. Council, do you have any questions? Councilman Brightwell? The... Uh, Excuse my throat again, my, my voice. Um, I'm fairly familiar with Oregon, and I know they were kind of like a leader with respect to how best to uh, start capturing mileage. So uh, how, how are we using their, their model or their way of doing things uh, to our advantage? The reason you hear a lot about Oregon is because they have managed to figure out a way to kind of keep everyone quote unquote happy. Uh, one of the biggest concerns you're going to hear about is Big Brother, because if you are providing your miles driven each year, there's a theory of, uh, that it's going to be a Big Brother. So Oregon came out with the idea that if you spend or if you drive a certain amount of miles, so just let's just say it's 15,000 miles, you're just going to pay up front 15,000 miles and you won't be tracked. Um, so that's one of the reasons you hear Oregon for so often is because they have managed to kind of figure it out before the rest of the country has. Okay, thank you. Councilman Frazier? Yeah, <clears throat> on that mileage, is that self-reported? I believe we're gonna, so the vehicles already have a tracker. I don't wanna be giving out too many engineering <laughs> secrets. They already have a tracker built into them. Maybe not, and am I not supposed to say that, Nancy? Even, um, the, older one? Even <laughs> the older ones? No, not the older no, ones, the newer ones. Role. They actually <laughs> already have, a, it's not turned on, um, but there, there's already a way to track miles. <laughs> My office is gonna get so many phone calls right now. Um, there is a way to track those miles. It's not turned on. It's something that I believe you're gonna have to report to the Secretary of State each year. Um, we're still in the pilot, so We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out in the next few years for you. And this is only for the uh, vehicles that are registered in Michigan? Yes. So yes. the large truck traffic that we have that beat up our roads can come and go and... Keep doing what they're doing? Yeah, we still have to figure that out. But we're trying to at least, you, you, you know how government works. You've managed one problem and you got another crisis. So we're trying to figure it all out. So give me about five years. I can't believe it's going to take this long. But I'll come back each year and give you an update. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councilman Brightwell? Yeah, this is just an add on. You brought up another individual uh, where every kid will have a breakfast or a meal. And I clearly, since I was uh, uh, an, an adult, you know, we've been pushing that. Now, obviously, have you, this is more technical than anything else, probably more, more of a hint, human interest than anything else. What about the kids that are, uh, they don't need those meals? So are we, 
what, what, how, how's, that, how's that being handled? Do you mean students who may not need them because of? Yeah, financial. It's, it's for all students. Any public school student is eligible for so this. So we will, we will budget to provide a meal for every child there, although they might have. So you're assuming a lot of kids will, will leave home where they are able to be fed, but the mother or uh, father will say, just go to school to get fed? I, I, absolutely. I mean, yes, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, instead of, you know, it, well, there's a lot of stigma, you know, when we've been yeah. looking at this issue for a long time. Um, even coming from Farmington Hills, 30% <coughs> of our students were on, um, on, on free or reduced lunch. And this is a way to get rid of that stigma. You know, no one no longer is going to have to have that red piece of paper, pink piece of paper that says I'm on reduced lunch. And it, it may include those who financially may not need it, but I think anytime you offer a free breakfast or lunch to any student in the state of Michigan, overall, it's a much bigger benefit. You know, there's always going to be a few people that sneak in, but um, the grand scheme of things, I think this is the most wonderful, beautiful thing that the state can finally offer our students. No, I agree. I, yeah. I'm, I love the idea, really, when I saw it publicized. Of, uh, a little while back, I figured that was a great, grand idea. And I, I, I just assume it'll, it'll, it'll iron out over a period of time. You, yeah. get, you get a pattern. Okay, thank you. Councilman Cruz? Yes. Um, hi, Samantha. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, I liked everything you said about education from K-12 through higher ed, which is where I am and then built my career. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm like, you had to be at Wayne State when I was there. But <laughs> nonetheless, um, has there been any way that you guys came up with to incentivize students that take advantage of the scholarship programs or whatnot to stay in Michigan? Or um, have you been working with business and all that kind of stuff so we can keep that talent here? Councilman Cruz, I thought you were going to zig a little bit with that question. So, <laughs> I thought we were going to get into FAFSA completion, which oh, is, no. we know that was I, I hate issue. FAFSA. <laughs> uh, so, well, I thought of that. We are incentivizing students who fill out the FAFSA. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're working on, right now we can't regulate it. Um, we can't force school districts to have FAFSA completion to graduate. So there's an incentive there that I can talk to you a little bit more offline. Um, and But one of the big things uh, we are doing, um, can you ask your question one more time? No, I was more concerned on the back end. Like if someone does the FAFSA, takes the scholarship. Oh, that, okay, yeah. What can we do to incentivize them to stay in Michigan and not take their talents to South Beach? You, you, <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I apologize. I, so for those of you who have known me for a very long time, this is one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Um, I'm still going through an oral chemo for breast cancer, and I get this thing called chemo brain, so it's really embarrassing mm -hmm. when I literally forget the question you've just asked me. So I apologize for that. Uh, but we are working on a few different things. So we kind of started investigating how many students actually left from getting a bachelor's degree from Michigan. Surprisingly enough, even at Michigan State, 89% of our Michigan students stay in Michigan. We only really have one school that kind of drifts away. Um, that's University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. But majority of the in-state students stay in-state. So we're trying to figure out a different kind of way to incentivize. But I, I, I would love to talk to you about this a little bit more because we've got some really creative ideas and I think you and I can make a big partnership on this one. Um, yeah. But we're working on it. It was just surprising to figure out that is not as many students as we thought that were leaving that are originally from Michigan. Well, that's good to know. But yeah, I'd be glad to work with you however oh, love I can. <laughs> All right, um, going back to Act 51, it will take several years to reformulate oh. and figure figure all the details out of that. Oh yeah. All right. I Thanks. wish I could say it's going to happen tomorrow, but the, the task force we had it started last year: three Republicans, three Democrats, and the whole idea is, and we brought in everyone. This wasn't just a let's figure out how to bring in EVs. Um, so not only did we bring in the big three, not only did we bring in people who make the charging stations. We brought in our convenience stores. We brought in our gas stations. We brought in every single industry 
that would be affected by moving to this kind of model. So it's going to take a long time because we can't, we can't leave a business behind. Um, and one of the biggest concerns is going to be our gas station. So we're working out ways to move forward where they're still keeping the same income as they are now. Um, a lot of meetings we've had, it's very interesting that um, major a lot of the money they make is actually on the convenience store part, not just necessarily on the gas. So we're learning a lot, um, and we don't want to make any quick decisions. Uh, this is not the time to do that because we're hoping that this will be sustainable for the next 80 years. Okay. Thank you. And we do, you know, thank you for, for coming, even though it was a little <laughs> late. That's fine. Um, feel free to come back anytime. Give us more we updates. We will be back. I'll have a lot more updates for you. As I said, this is the first time of the trifecta. I serve in leadership myself. So I serve uh, with Speaker Joe Tate on his core team. So I haven't been able to get in here as often as, uh, let's just say negotiations are a little bit more intense when you're fighting on the same side for the first time in 40 years. Everyone's top priority is kind of like everyone else's fifth, sixth, seventh. So it's been very interesting to deal with this new type of, of politics and in Lansing. So I'll be back a lot more and I can't wait. Mm -hmm. And for those of you interested, I should probably say this, um, Senator Jeremy and Moss and I, we still do monthly coffee hours. We do, I believe it's the last Monday of every month here in Southfield at the Southfield Library, 5.30. And then we also have um, the first Monday of every month at the Bloomfield Township Library at 5.30. And anyone's welcome to come. Okay, thank right. you thank very you much. Thank you everyone, good thank to see you. you. All right, we have a, another planning presentation and discussion regarding a proposed multi-tenant commercial building, including an urgent care, pharmacy, and retail. Uh, thank you, Council. This is an uh, item for discussion. We'll be voting on this one and the following one and the final meeting this month. This is a conditional rezoning and site plan review for a new build. It is a vacant property on Losher, uh, just a little south of 10 Mile. It came in a couple of years back for a rezoning of the north parcel from OS to B1 with a conditional rezoning. What they determined was they didn't quite have enough land to make a workable development. So they acquired the southern parcel. I think it's a new owner now too that's done this. They're coming in to rezone the south parcel to match the north with the same conditions. Uh, to be one, it'll end up being, as you can see, it's actually got some vegetation on there. Um, it's front slosher, behind is uh, the homes on Lois Lane. Got a few photos here. This is uh, the top ones from the parking lot to the right north. Then we've got from Losher, and then kind of looking across the residential properties on Lois Lane to the back of the property is the bottom right. Uh, here's the B1 and OS, the current zoning. They want to rezone the south to match the B1 with the conditions. And it is, uh, future land use plan is local mixed use, which would be consistent with either an OS or B1 zoning. Now you can see here's the basic site plan. You're looking at a five unit commercial building. The north unit is the urgent care pharmacy, which is the, uh, the developer that's gonna be his business. And then he's gonna be leasing out the remaining spaces. And you can just see the basic unit layout and then they do have a little bit, they have a conceptual floor plan for the urgent care pharmacy <coughs> since that's going to be the anchor business. Uh, landscape plan, um, you've got, you know, trees and sh shrubbery kind of screening the area. One of the conditions is they're retaining a conservation easement at the rear of the property uh, for 76 feet. They're not only, they're not even developing that much of it, it's about 150 feet to where they're developing. Elevations. Uh, of the center, various views of that. And then these are the actual, con oh, sorry, the exact, the actual conditions that are proposed. They're uh, excluding pawn shops, excluding firearms related businesses, excluding sexually oriented businesses, uh, excluding dining establishments greater than 2,000 square feet, excluding marijuana based businesses, excluding drive through restaurants. They do will, will have a drive up window for the pharmacy and they're providing the 76 foot conservation easement at the rear of the property, which will permanently provide that um, natural buffer for the residences on Lois Lane. And this is just the, uh, the color rendering of the site plan, and I believe the petitioner and the here are here to comment. 
If you can just give your name and address for the record. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Carol Thurber. I am with Noack and Prowse Engineers. We're the engineer for the developer. Um, I have boards, but it's all of the same things that you've seen before you. Um, I believe everything has been covered as far as, um, as what is proposed. Um, just a few quick comments. Uh, the Planning Commission had uh, requested uh, a consideration for additional parking, should it be needed. Um, so there is land bank parking indicated now, um, should it be needed. Uh, right now the calculations show that if, uh, if everything is developed as planned with the uh, urgent care and the pharmacy and then a retail use, uh, the uh, site is adequately parked. If, uh, for instance, a small restaurant, not uh, over 2,000 square feet as per the conditional zoning, but if it were a sandwich shop or something like that that would come in, uh, we have uh, provided for the additional parking if it would be needed. All right, Council, any questions? Councilwoman Banks. Thank you. Um, do we know how many urgent care facilities we have in Southfield? I'm not aware of a comprehensive list of them at this time. Well, I couldn't say for certain. Um, is there a way you can get that number um, to the council, please? It just seems like there's a lot of urgent care facilities popping up all over the place. Um, and also, near this location, isn't there an urgent care um, facility across the street in the Majestic Shopping Center? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is so across from Southfield High. This is south of ten mile. Oh, south of ten mile. Right. Across. Okay, I'm thinking it's closer to. It doesn't really show the context, but we're right directly across the Southfield High, and then south of Southfield High is residential. So it's next to the school. It's across the street from the school. No, not Southfield High. There's also a charter school to the south of that. Yes. 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 The it's church, church across to the here. south. Yes. Oh, so it's further down. So you're closer to ten mile. Yeah. Closer so to ten mile. It's the gas station at the corner. Miles. One commercial building, and then this is the next property. It's oh, fairly so close to ten mile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a piece of property that Jonathan Greatman had. <laughs> it wasn't large enough to build much of anything on it. Okay. A lot of trees. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I I'd just be curious just about the number of urgent yeah. care. I, I'm I just. I mean, just, just the other day when I was driving, I mean, at one time we talked about nail salons and they were popping up all over. And it's not just Southfield, it's all over. I mean, how many urgent care facilities do we need, you know, I'll just say in the Oakland County area? And then is this particular urgent care facility affiliated with any hospital? If you can give your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. I'm Rabib Deir. I'm the owner of the property. I'm a physician at McLaren Hospital. So no, this is uh, so the urgent care. We check the area for urgent care. The closest urgent care, I think, is 2.2 mile, like uh, close to Providence Hospital in South Sud area. So that's more than two mile from this location. And for now, this urgent care is just private urgent care. It doesn't, it's not associated with the hospital. So like I know like Bowman, they have their own urgent care and some other hospital, but this is just like the private owner. I'll be the main owner for the urgent care. So, so if someone needs stitches or something, do you, do you provide those services there yeah, or course, you would say you have to go to well, Providence depend, or Beaumont? Uh, well, it depends on the condition of the patient. Some patients, you just, they don't need to go to the hospital. And that's uh, really why the urgent care ex exists now <coughs> because they can save time for the patients to come walk in and leave quickly for urgent need. And that's it. They don't have to go to the hospital except like certain condition, they may need to go to the hospital. No, thank you. And I, I, like I said, I was just wondering why so many of them all of a sudden were 
it seems like after COVID, just popping up all over. It looks like the plans of your building are beautiful, so thank you. It's, it's very, very attractive, but um, I'd be curious again, in Southfield, how many urgent care facilities we have. Thank you. Councilman Frazier? Yeah, uh, my questions are very similar to uh, Councilwoman Banks. Um, is there enough place for parking for your urgent care if you have a restaurant there too? Yes, and a, and yes a pharmacy? there is. Um, the parking calculations were completed as part of the site plan. And um, if a restaurant were to be added, uh, currently it is, there's about six extra spaces. If a restaurant were to be added, there is a provision for land bank parking in the rear and that would be developed. Because if I remember right, that's a narrow, deep piece of property. It is, and that was why it previously really didn't work as the one acre parcel by uh, combining the two parcels, there was enough room to have the circulation that was necessary. Um, how large is your pharmacy going to be? It's a small pharmacy, it's mainly for the, I think 200? Yeah, the, uh, for, just for the urgent care patients, like mainly. They, instead, you know, they go somewhere else, they can just come back and they have their prescription ready to pick it up. Just, just go around and just pick it up. It's a small pharmacy. So if I needed, uh, some medication, I couldn't come there to, to do it because... It, yeah. it will be open to the public, but it is generally intended to uh, also assist those that come to the urgent care so that they don't have to make another stop. Yeah, uh, one of the questions that uh, Councilwoman Banks asked is about how many there are. And it seems to me uh, about three, four months ago, and uh, President, you can help me with that, we kind of tussled a little bit before he made a decision, but it was a special uh, uh, urgent care because people had to walk to it rather than. No, the, it was that was the unfortunately the presenter did not present that well. Pardon? It was just a regular urgent care that he was proposing. The issue he argued with the planning commission and our and the city council was he felt he didn't need the additional parking because people would be walking to his building. And that's where we told them get additional parking and then come back. Okay, but the the uh, d difference with that one and all the rest of them is a fair number of people that would possibly go to that one would be walking rather than driving. Potentially, yes. Potentially, I mean, yeah. I would don't want anybody to go there, but if they have to, correct? Because it was in, it was like right outside, right in, inside of a neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would also like to know how many there are because uh, uh, we got trapped into the dollar store thing uh, by not uh, putting a moratorium on how many dollar stores there were until we found out that they were popping up all over the place and still are according to the news. So uh, that's all the questions I have. Thanks. Okay. And, and I think to Councilman Banks' question about how many urgent cares. When that urgent care came to us a few months ago, I believe we did have a count. Um, I don't know if it was the entire city, and that was done through assessing. Um, they just pulled anything that had like urgent care in the name, I, I believe. Um, yeah, but I think that number was in there. It was not a lot. There may even be more storage facilities than urgent cares, I don't know. Um, but. Um, to our planning department, you may want to talk with our city assessor. I believe he, he pulled those, and it may be in our past minutes from a few months ago. Very good. I'll look into that. All right, Council, any other questions that you may have? Um, I do have one question. The design is very nice. Is there going to be, you know, how long um, Southfield Road, a lot of the businesses we now require, you know, the 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 fencing in front, is there going to be anything like that in front of this, this building or is it strictly going to be shrubbery? Yeah, this um, one is proposing a hedge. Yes. The fencing is in. A hedge along the. Yeah, there's a continuous hedge along all the front of the parking in the landscape plan and a fairly substantial tree planting. Yes. Okay. Um, as well as maintaining uh, the natural buffer in the rear. Mm -hmm. Right. 
it looks like there's quite a number of trees in the back there. So. There are. <laughs> um, all right, council, any other questions? All right, so this will be back before us in two weeks for a public hearing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next item is a presentation and discussion regarding a proposed daycare home with a maximum of 12 children. This is, as, as you said, a daycare home, what the state calls a group child care home because it is a mac from seven to 12. Uh, family to child care home is, you know, one to six. And then a commercial child care center is more than that in a commercial building. This is on Pierce Avenue uh, at Stratford on the corner. This would be the south uh, east corner. Um, directly across the street of Stratford Woods Park. Uh, this was in front of the Planning Commission last month. You can see the uh, home here. It's a corner lot, kind of a large side yard and front yard. The backyard is a little smaller, but it is large enough to meet the state requirements and they do have a public park directly across the street. Go, we go. R3 residential, single family future land use, all very consistent. The floor plans, the child care centers as it's, the, as it's been presented is mainly occurring on the main floor. There is a second floor to the house. Um, the only use of that would be occasionally if they need an additional bathroom. And the basement is not going to be used. That's uh, more of a utility space. But we do include it on the plans for completeness. And uh, the petition is here um, to uh, answer questions. If you could just give your name and address for the record, please. Joseph Nadiv, 24346 Pierce Street. We are the primary owners and residents of this facility in question. Did you have anything to add? Um, sure, I, just, I, just, I think I, the presentation was very well said, but just to add to it, um, the COVID-19 pandemic put a lot of child cares out of business. And because many people were not at work, they didn't need to send their children there. Now that there's a return to the office and return to work, there really is a shortage of child care. This has been acknowledged at a state level. Governor Whitmer has signed into, legisl into uh, legislation various um, laws in order to try to ensure cutting red tape as well as giving grants, which we actually qualified for and we actually have grant money. We received grant money to open this, this location, this facility. Um, and we actually know personally of people in our neighborhood that haven't been able to find child care and haven't been able to return to work. So when I look around the, w the room and I see that it says Southfield, do your part, so we feel like we're also trying to do our part and trying to allow people to get back to work. It's really a needed, it's a need in general in our subdivision, in the state, in the community, um, and we want to try to do the best we can to try to help people get back to work. Um, my wife is the primary educator and um, she can answer any educational questions, but she has the background and experience. She's been working in early education for 20 years um, and I think her credentials speak for herself. So. Take Council any questions. Councilman Hogue? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, what will the ages of the children be? Hi, so I'm Deborah. I'm also the petitioner here. Um, so we would like to have a license from zero to 16. But um, the age group that I'm targeting is two and a half to three and a half year olds um, in like an educational school setting. And I'm sorry, did I first hear you say zero to 16, the license for it? So that's a license that we're- Okay, but you, you're targeting- But I'm just, I'm just gonna be doing a two and a half to three, three and a half year old group. And your hours of operation? From 8.45 to 1.45. 1.45? 1.45. Some morning program. And with the uh, 12 children it is, how many uh, staff are you required? One. Just one? Two, two in total, myself and then <coughs> another staff member, member. Okay, and I don't think we saw on here, we said the main floor, um, how is the setup of the house where the children will be? Like is there beds, is it, um, like what does that look like? You don't have a picture of how you plan to have the inside be? like how you're gonna separate it from yeah. your home. So can you go back to the uh, floor plan, please? Well, the main floor plan is the one to the left. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have three main rooms, I guess. Um, a bathroom and a kitchen. So the kitchen I'm gonna keep closed off. 
that's not part of the, the playgroup um, usage. Um, I'm not doing any nap time. It's just a half day program. So I don't have any bedding. We are allowed to use the upstairs, even though it's not, um, not where the daycare is gonna be. But if I do have a child who needs to sleep, I can make separate arrangements with a parent and have them in some type of crib or something on the upper floor, um, which I'm not really planning to do. Um, and then I would have one room as like a play space room. One room will be for tables and chairs for eating time. And another room, another room can be just book time and relaxing time, maybe puzzles or something. Okay. And my last question, you indicated um, just that small frame of hours. But d would this allow them to change those hours of operation, Mr. Yeah. The Planning Commission's recommended condition did have hours, and they, the Planning Commission recommended a little bit broader hours in case the program would expand as their, as their children got older and they had more time. But that will be before you um, from the Planning Commission's recommendation. And they did recommend wider hours. I just don't I have it right on top of my head okay. at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The, the, I believe it was, I think it was 745 to 5 o'clock or something like yeah. Something like that, even though they're not operating it during that time frame, but just in case they decide to expand later, they didn't want to be tied down to a specific. Yeah, it, it would allow for a full day program if they decided to do that in the future. It wouldn't be limited to a half day program based on the Planning Commission's recommended conditions. Thank you. All right, Councilman Brightwell. Yeah, I, um, we haven't seen one of these in quite a while, but well, at least I haven't. Um, this, seat, this the state authorized you to do this. Who gives the uh, certificate of, of occupancy? Does it, will our uh, city building authority inspect this facility? The city building department would have to actually inspect it and do a certificate of occupancy as a group child care home, and the state would inspect and do a license. Okay. So the city inspects and the state inspects. They both inspect. Okay. The, in essence, as I recall, we did this a while back for one. What, kind, what type of fire escape uh, mechanism will you have in place, do you plan to have in place? So the state has requirements that on every floor that children will be occupying, you need to have two modes of egress. One of them has to be direct to ground, and one of them is allowed to be a window. So that means that we're allowed to use on the second floor, as long as we have a stairwell that goes downstairs, that's explicit in the technical manual. So I should have said at the outset, the state has, you can go to Lara's website, it's called the Child Care Technical Manual. It's a 270 page manual of all the rules of the child care. So I've been learning up that book and I think I know it fairly well. So I can try to give you basically every uh, code in there. So that for the second floor, we still qualify out the first floor. So the front door obviously counts and there is a door wall that goes out to the backyard. So that the building inspectors who came mentioned that we need a landing there. So we have a concrete crew that's supposed to be coming at some point to install a set of steps with a landing with a concrete frost, frost footing. We're having a difficult time finding a contractor because most contractors that do this type of foundation work say it's too small of a job for them. So we're still kind of battling that out. But we're, it's, our approval is conditional on that being approved. Okay, okay. Um, I realize the state authorized you to, 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 to perform this type of work. The, in this book you were talking about, Oh, you tell me there's a schematic or plan in there for fire escape for for this type of as long as you have two modes of, as long as you have two modes of egress that's fine you don't need a technical fire escape or any type of ladder outside the building you just need to make sure that there's two ways to get out of the house on any floor okay is would the city of Southfield be inspecting and tick checking that office and that that is in place yes and and they have come already they what? The building inspectors have already been to our premises. Okay. The city, All right. city inspectors. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Council President, I did find in my notes the recommended hours of operation from the Planning Commission was 7.30 to 6. Okay. That was close. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Councilwoman Taylor, do you have a question? Mm, no. Oh. I think it's good. It's welcomed. It has been a while since we had a child daycare. But it is necessary. I totally agree with you there. And parents will safe going to a neighborhood 
going to a home in their neighborhood because they see you all the time. And it's good for the children as well. It helps them with their learning and all of that. So. Thank you. You're actually reminding me to fill in something that I forgot to mention before, is that one of the questions that came up at the Planning Commission was regarding parking. So as you mentioned before, we, ha we are at a corner lot, so we do have about seven or eight spots, and we can accommodate 12 children. So unless we have a massive influx at the same time, which that's not really the nature of a child care, it doesn't, it's not a school. So we're not starting classes at a rigid time. People can come and drop off and pick up as they, as they want. But we also had our neighbors that were willing to give frontage in front of their house. They didn't mind. They felt it was an asset to them. But um, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, right. Most of the people, anyway, are in our subdivision. Like, we're targeting people that are within a half a mile radius or so. It's, about, it's less than a 10-minute walk. And you're in the corner, I noticed. And so you have that extra room, anyway, for parking. So right. I didn't think that was an issue. But yeah, that's Thank really you. good. Right. Councilman Cruz? Yeah. Um, so this doesn't have a basement? We're not going to be operating in the basement at all. It's not even finished. Oh, okay. All right. We don't go down there either. It's spooky. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, and um, is there a fence in the backyard? Yes, there is. I've actually temporarily taken it down because they're doing concrete work in the backyard. But yes, it is fenced in. Okay. So that's where the kids will have And that's time. a state requirement as well. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Great. All yes. right. I, I could just couldn't tell from here, but all right, so that's good. Just want to know. All right, thank you. That was all. All right, Councilman Banks. Thank you. Um, my question also was regarding fencing, so thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. You're proposing to um, take care of two and a half and three and a half year olds. Um, as a proud grandmother of a two and a half and a four year old, how can two staff people handle 12 two and a half to three and a half year olds? Okay. Um, I am coming with experience of working both in preschools and in, um, in daycares in a home environment. And I found the key of, um, of being able to, to care for these 12 children um, being with keeping everyone scheduled. If we have somewhat of a daily schedule, the children know what to expect and they're excited to do the next activity and um, it's, um, yeah, it'll, it'll, it works, it's good. Um, one of the, usually like if it's like a circle time or a snack time, you can have the, one of the adults doing the main activity and then the assistant, the other adult, can deal with anyone who is not complying or someone who needs the special attention. But it is going to be running somewhat as like a, um, a structured day um, where the children will, they, they want to be part of the group and it's going to be done in a way where they'll, they'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. I guess to the planner, are there any state regulations regarding the ratio? Um, years ago, I thought there was there something like it was um, like two people for every three yeah. young adults. I mean, I, I personally cannot see how two people can handle 12 children within this range. It, there's no such thing as a perfect child. They're up, they're down, they're rolling. You know, someone might get a boo-boo or whatever. You need there, more. There's a, there's a table in the manual, the state manual, and it is two for 12 in this age range. It's just a table. It's two. You, if two, you had infants, there would be required more. That actually triggers more, but it's two for two for 12. Yeah, that's exactly what's in the state manual for licensing. Two individuals for 12 little toddlers. Okay. Now, they do have to have training. They do have to have background checks. They have to have first aid training. There's, there's a, it's not just some random person off the street that meets the qualifications to get licensed. And what if, what if they're under two and a half years old? Uh, I think it, it only changes when they're literally like infants in hand. Once they're toddlers, it kind of all falls in that same range for pre-K. And also, you had indicated, like, nap, you know, if they're tired, they can go upstairs to take a nap. Um, 
I, I guess I'm not even understanding. I, I think the concept is good, but I'm not understanding your proposal. Is it just like kind of a drop in? I want to go, you know, shopping for two hours or I have to go to work for two or three hours. I'm going to drop the child off. I don't, I'm not understanding this. No, so it is, it is going to be somewhat of a school, I guess. Um, you know, obviously the children, you know, they're not all going to arrive exactly yet the same time just because who knows what was going on at home. Um, but in my experience, it really, it really does work when you run it with a certain schedule. I've done this many, many, many years, and I, I have not, I, you know, I have not had an issue. Even, you know, I've done even 14 children with two, with two adults, um, you know, both in a school setting and in a home setting. Um, yeah, it works. Okay, thank you. I guess also just, you know, as being a mother of a, a bunch of younger children, um, it's just a, a talent that you can pick up, just being able to juggle and to prioritize um, and just, you know, just getting the group to, to work as a group and then having that other adult to be there to help with all of the in the straggler situations. Now, does the number 12 include your children, or is it your children plus an additional 12? According to state regulations, it's only 12 unrelated children. So we are allowed to have our own children at home. Um, but being that it, that wouldn't work too well. So I'm just doing a morning program when my own children are in school. I will have a baby at home, but my the older children will all be in school within that time frame. Okay. Thank you. Let me just clarify that. We're operating on a school schedule, so it's not going to happen. We're not masochistic. We don't want to try to have our own kids plus a bunch of other kids in our house. That would be too much to handle. That would yeah. be a mess. It would take me a week to dig out of that. So we're not, we're not going for that. I wouldn't let her do that. <laughs> right. But uh, the... Um, yeah, obviously the children are only going to be there when my kids are going to be out of the house. There's no way we could manage that. But as far as being able to manage 12 kids with two, adult, with two adults in the room, there are many, there are thousands of these facilities all around the state. So the state has a plan that manages this, and they do spot inspections, and they make sure you're compliant. And if you can look at citations for many of the facilities that have been cited, they get cited for even the most basic of things, like failing to write the child's last name on an attendance sheet or like leaving a child alone in the bathroom without supervision. Like everything is documented and taken care of. The state really runs a very tight ship. So like Mr. Payson was saying before, we have to be CPR certified, tuberculosis tested. There's no radon in the house. Like we've really, when I say been through the ringer, I don't mean it in a negative way. I'm just saying that we're trying to comply. There's a lot of regulations surrounding this to ensure the safety of the children. Thank you. Councilman Frazier. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I guess I missed, uh, what you were talking about, the children will primarily be on the first floor. But you say you will also have some on the, on the second floor if they want to take a nap or something? Uh, is that, did I hear you say that right? Or Just in order for the approval not to be conditional on leaving the children on the first floor, we're just Could you stand closer to the microphone? Sure, I'm sorry. In order for the approval for this not to be conditional on leaving the children only on the first floor, we're just leaving that open that we may want to bring children upstairs. That's not the plan. It's not the goal. But just in case, like my wife is saying, there is a child who is tired, who needs to go to sleep. We don't want it to be that we get cited. You put a child upstairs when you weren't allowed to. So in the situation, again, we don't want to, if a child is, is tired, we're not going to say, I'm sorry, you can't go to sleep because the city of Southwell didn't let. We don't want that type of eventuality to take place. So we're just requesting that the approval should also take into consideration that we may put children upstairs. But it, it will be under the guidance of the state. They have regulations of where the children can sleep, how you can monitor them while they're sleeping, where if they can be in a crib or in a bed, or you have to have the proper gates on the top of the stairs. There's very many regulations of how to safely have a child sleeping upstairs while the adults are downstairs, which we're, we'll follow. We're going to follow all those regulations. Well, the thing that concerns me, if you have someone upstairs, well, one thing is, you have to barricade the top of the stairs so they don't fall yeah. down the stairs. But the other thing is, if you have to have two, two ways out of a building, uh, how do you come 
how do you what's your second way out from upstairs? So according to state regulation, the second egress on the second floor of a house can be a window. Uh, could you talk just a bit slower? Sure, sorry. According to the state technical manual, a window qualifies as a second egress when it's on the second floor of a home. Not when it's on the third floor and not when it's on the basement, in the basement, but on the second floor of a home, that qualifies. So a set of, a flight of stairs inside the house plus a window is good enough. There better be somebody down below to catch them. <laughs> I mean, unless you have a ladder up the side of the house. Right, I'm assuming that the reason the state did that is because a fire, if the fire crew would need to be called in, they're able to evacuate a child from the second floor of the house. I wouldn't count on that. I mean, that's, that would not be part of, if I had a child that age who's coming to your place, that would not be part of the, the plan. Uh, if your child happens to be on the second floor, we'll wait till the fire department comes to get them out. Understood. I mean, I would think in your own home, would you leave your children upstairs sleeping when you were in the kitchen cooking food? Well, in my own, I have my own plan for escape. But if I'm trusting my child with someone else, I want to be comfortable knowing that my child will be safe, that when I come to pick them up, they'll be healthy and, and there. So that's my concern. The second thing is, with two people, it would seem like at mealtime and uh, with two and a half to three and a half, they don't really all entertain themselves. There's got to be something to keep them entertained unless you have, let them sit in front of TV all the time. So I don't know what your plans are for that either. But so my these are things that are going through my mind. In my experience, um, during mealtimes, it's always been the time either to teach whatever lesson I'm planning on giving over or reading books. They will sit and listen to books for hours. They enjoy it very much. Um, so during mealtime, we've always um, you know, had a stack of books, and they all sit, and they all eat. And if whenever someone would be finished eating, the other adult can help them put their food away and then move on to whatever the next activity is, uh, you know, a quiet Lego or books or something like that. OK, thank you. All right, um, just to piggyback off of what Councilman Banks and Fraser were, were talking about with having two, two people. So I can tell you, because it wasn't that long ago, I had my children in home daycare. And one was in my neighborhood, one was not in my neighborhood, but was still in a home in Southfield. And there were two adults for the 12 children. And I don't know how they did it, but my children were always happy, fed, clean when I came to pick them up. Um, you know, it's uh, even even my son who's eight. I threw him a birthday party with his class. It was just me. I don't know how the teachers do it either in the classroom because when I was just with my son at, and his friends, it um, it wasn't a disaster, but we were outside at a park and it was uh, it was a lot to handle. So, um, you know, how teachers, how daycare operators do it is beyond me, but it it seems to work. Um, so Can't hopefully, hopefully that helps with the uh, the, the, the two-person um, concern. Okay. Um, but you did mention that you're still having work done to qualify the, the home. Is the only thing left, is there cement, or are there more things that need to be completed? That's the only outstanding thing that was cited by the building inspections. Okay. And the city, I'm assuming, won't give a certificate until that's complete. Yeah, that I believe it's a landing for an e, for the, that second egress, and it has to be functional. So you're not going out the door and you know now, right off the edge. So, because so, another someone called me recently about a, a rental home with an inspection. It was the same issue. Does it have to be cement, or can it be wood, like a deck material? Um, I'm guessing it could be a deck. It just needs to be a minimum. My understanding is it needs to be the height of the door, just below the sill, and at least three by three. So that when you step out, you've got a landing, and then it has to be steps uh, from the building code. 
The actual landing and steps has not been the difficulty. The problem has been that according to city code, you need to have a frost footing underneath it, which is a 42 inch ditch that's dug underneath it in order to support it. So most people that we're contacting are like, for a small job like that, we're not willing to show up. And I've offered them more money and they're like, no, the city's getting involved, no, we're not touching that. So you, you already have a patio there, but so, it, it need, uh, I guess I don't know what a frost footing is. So I had three simple steps that you can walk into any home improvement store. I didn't put this in, I bought the house like that. Mm -hmm. but you can walk into any home improvement store and buy these like $80 concrete steps. And you just stack them one on top of the other and there were just three steps there that were going out of the house. So when the building inspectors looked at it, they said you can't have that because you need to have a landing on any egress door so that people when they're opening the door don't fall off the steps. That's standard building code. Right, and that is building code, I verify that, it's true, they're correct. So it's not the actual steps, it's the, it's a, is it like a railing? Well, no, to install the masonry, you have to actually put footings down to 42 inches so it doesn't frost heave. So it's the depth of the footing. So you gotta go down 42 inches because that's frost depth. In the building, it's Michigan building code. It's not a local South Hill requirement. Okay. So in essence, you gotta, you have to go underneath the current steps that are there? So I've already torn them out. I applied for a permit as a homeowner, and I'm still waiting for it to be issued, but I can't wait because we're trying to open in September. Which, if I may be bold and just talk to that point, I know that we're not approved yet, but we're right now hung up. We cannot apply with the state until we get this zoning. So, I know I'm being very bold right now, but if there's a way we can at least get some type of documentation from the city so that we can move on with the state, because we still have about three or four weeks worth of training, and we cannot open for the school year as we're still in limbo like this. So just depend, again, you can always rescind it, you can reject it, you can shut us down, you know where we live, you know who we are. But just for us to be able to multitask so that we're not in this hurry up and wait situation, if there's anything you can do to help us out, would also be very appreciated. Okay. And that's after the, you're saying after the city approval, you have another month or so? Right, we're about three weeks. Yeah, I don't know if the city wants to get in the habit of. Well, we have know. to actually sign off on their state license application that they have zoning approval, which won't happen until after the public hearing. Okay. Which is in two weeks. Yes. Council Meeks. Last question. So, and it's probably to our um, building director. I don't know. The planner may know. The planner also may know. On the second floor, um, <laughs> Councilman Frazier um, asked, you know, if there was a fire, there better be someone down there to catch it. Isn't there um, like steps or something that? It, like it rolls up and heaven forbid if there like was a, a, an escape ladder. A, a ladder, an escape ladder that would go onto the second floor. I mean, that bothers me that if someone's up there, there's no escape on the second floor. Yeah, I don't know if that meets the requirement, but those do exist. I used to have one in my own. But my is, that, is that part of our code or part of the state code? Uh, He's no? saying no. No. No? Chuck says no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's weird, but in the basement, you have to have steps to get out of the basement, but on the second floor, mm -hmm. you can just say, hey, catch, catch the baby. We huh? do have balconies under, it happens to be under maybe three out of the four rooms that have windows. We, with our own children, we practice with them. Mm -hmm. You know, wrap yourself in a blanket and you can jump on the balcony and then jump into the bushes that are underneath it. Oh, Thank so you. The skydiving you know, here. <laughs> Councilman Brightwell. Uh, you know, in all honesty, I'm, I'm, for, I'm for this, but when you come back, I will be uh, dealing with the unusual and all the emergencies because, uh, excuse my voice again, but when I've seen these in the past come before council, we kind of dealt, Gerald drilled down on what happens when the unexpected happen with kids. So I will be asking some of those questions, specifically about fire, fire being one of the issues. So, um, I, and I think you indicate there's a big book, a state book or something. So, um, and I want, you should pull out your state book before you come back. But it sounds like they've addressed those issues. It's just, it doesn't require anything on the second floor. Okay, well, I'm just, I'm gonna ask at the next session. I, 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 haven't heard, I haven't heard what I wanted to hear, so that's, 
that was the mist that our I was state born. rep was just here. So you, you want to hear? Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm certainly prepared to address that at length. Like I said, I've been through the manual multiple times, so I think I know fairly well what's required from a state level. Again, the city <clears> can decide that you want to take on different rules than the state, and you're entitled to do that. Like I think that these rules have been vetted. Like I said, there are thousands of these facilities throughout the state, and I think the amount of issues that have been reported are minimal. Um, I can forward anybody here that can talk to a LARA representative um, to talk about what issues have come up in various child cares, and I think that they're relatively minimal. Like I said, the state does run a tight ship. We've dealt with them. We know, we know what's going on. And they've been a, on the one, they're a pleasure to work with, but they enforce the rules. Councilwoman Hope? I was just going to remind us all that the state does regulate this, and so they all have to pass that. So even though we may question some things, the state has already done that for us. It's regulated, so once they receive the okay at the state level, they've passed everything that they're required to pass. So I just wanted to remind us of that, and I support it as well. Thank you. All right. yeah. Thank you. I was, and I was just gonna say the same thing. Uh, you know, I mean, I supervised three, uh, five children's centers um, in, the, in three t years time, and I know how the state is. Mm -hmm. It's no joke that the two persons for 12 people, that's just, that's standard. It really is. Uh, it sound, doesn't sound like it should be, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so we had all, all ages though, but nonetheless, um, sound like uh, uh, mm -hmm. Councilwoman has just said, um, if they meet their due diligence with the state, um, then I, I'm, I'm okay with it. So that's just my two cents. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if there's no other questions, this will be back in two weeks with the public hearing. Okay. And hopefully you have that cement fixed so the city can uh, sign off on it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, next we have an MML annual convention voting delegates. And so this is for those who will be in attendance at the MML annual convention. We need to have two members of our council who will be considered voting delegates. Do we have any takers? I'll volunteer. Okay. Um, do we have a second taker? I'll nominate uh, Councilwoman Banks. You're going, right? Yes, but uh, Councilman Cruz said that he might be considered oh. to be doing it. Oh. So. Okay. Yes, I would. Yeah, so so um, maybe uh, we can have alternate. Taylor just in and case. Cruz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll be, the, I'll be the alternate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will have the voting delegate as Councilman Taylor and the alternate delegate as Councilman Cruz. Is, is everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to fight <laughs> for it? All right, so we just need a motion. I move that we um, have and select Councilwoman Taylor as our delegate and Councilman Cruz as our alternate. Second. It has been moved by Councilman Hogue, supported by Councilman Frazier, that we will have Councilwoman Taylor as our delegate and Councilman Cruz as our alternate delegate at the MML annual convention in October of 2023. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. Now we're up to the council portion of our meeting and we will start with Councilwoman Hogue. Oh, I just had one thing, quick thing. Um, I wanted to give kudos and thanks to uh, Ms. PG for the Monday, July 31st, Stop the Gun Violence Community Forum that we um, had attended and it was well attended by many residents from multiple cities um, led by our Chief Barron then from Detroit, uh, Chief White, Farmington Hills, that police chief King, I think, and then Oak Park Director Cooper, him, Cooper. and then uh, 
Wayne County Sheriff uh, Washington, I believe. Yep, right. um, just a very good opportunity, and I hope that uh, Ms. PG and Chief Barron are going to continue that because it was a lot of discussion, and I think that, the, to me, the overall theme was that there's no one reason for gun violence and that it's multiple reasons, and it's, it's necessary for all of our communities to come together to work on the solution. So I just wanted to thank um, Ms. PG and Chief Barron for taking the lead for the city of Southfield. It was a great uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Brightwell. Yes, I just want to uh, bring up, well, I have two items. One on September 29th at the uh, John Dingle uh, VA Center downtown from 1.30 to from 11.30 to 1.30, they will have a suicide prevention walk at the, at the uh, Dingle Center. It's starting at uh, 11.30. And this is a recurring concern of the VA. We have a lot of veterans who are uh, affected by war uh, and are affected by their military duties. And, it, and it, uh, the VA puts a lot of effort into suicide prevention. So we were asking, they will have a food truck available that day, and also they will have numerous other items. But it, it is for the uh, for the benefit of our veterans. And although you may not be a veteran, please pass the message on. And we and veterans are constantly seeking. Um, you know, remedies to their uh, to their issues. And that, again, that's September the 29th at the VA Center at John Dingle. And um, this, I, I, I probably, I've done this a couple of times, but I, might, I think this will be the last time I do it. But I want to thank the uh, Art Commission for what they are doing for our lobby. And that is based on knowledge that when I first became a council person, I would constantly hear from residents who would visit this facility and they would ask me, what is wrong with your lobby up at City Hall? Something to that effect. That, I got that quite a bit. And so I'm, I'm just really uh, thankful. And I'm, I've, I've said this before, but and I, I'm just thankful that the Art Commission, the mayor and the Art Commission has really taken, it, taken um, the lobby under their wings and making it pre presentable. So when individuals walk in, they will realize that uh, this is a working lobby. Uh, it's something that has been addressed. Whereas I'm a, historically, the lobby was not a, a working lobby. It was not being addressed. It was the, the lobby was homeless and no one cared anything about it. So I'm just thankful that um, it's being looked at now. And I did, see um, the chair of the Art Commission at the Kimmy Horn thing this weekend. I mentioned to her I would be uh, mentioning how, more, how grateful I am as a council, council person that we are um, yeah. doing something with our lobby and we are rotating the, uh, the appearance of the lobby on a regular basis, which, which adds to the, uh, the appeal of it. So I've done that a couple times this year. I, I will probably not do it again this year so but I do appreciate it thank you thank you councilman Taylor thank you uh, first I'd like to say thank you to our clerk in our clerk's office for a successful election no hiccups no nothing everything was successful so thank you very much for that and I'll also like to take this time to wish you a belated happy birthday hey. <laughs> you tried to keep a secret <laughs> are you gonna sing I could. <laughs> but then I also want to remind everyone that we will have our uh, summertime, summer wind down this Friday here at the municipal campus from 7 to 9, uh, featuring Alex Gro Goss, I'm sorry, Alex Goss, and the Detroit Soul Rhythm Band. That'll be this Friday on the front lawn. And I'm also going to remind everyone for the uh, library's jazz and blues. Uh, in the meeting room on Wednesdays, I believe it's Wednesdays. The, in September, they're going to have women in jazz. It's going to be very exciting. So uh, mark your calendars for that event. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councilman Cruz. Yeah, I really didn't have anything uh, to share this evening, but uh, in light of the fact that it sounds like it's pouring down rain outside, um, I hope everybody's electricity holds up and be sure to go down in your basements and check them out. Um, I realized just recently some, flo some flooding down there. I had to get some grading done uh, because I don't go down there very much because <laughs> that's where the workout equipment is, so I don't go there. <laughs> but uh, just take a look peek down there if you haven't already and uh, just to make sure that's all I had. <laughs> Thank you. Councilman Banks. Thank you. Some of the, uh, my comments have already been said but I also would like to really reiterate to the city clerk um, congratulations on a successful election. Hopefully it will be that smooth in November. <laughs> Councilman Frazier. Yes. Uh, first thing I'd like to say uh, uh, congratulations to the two people that were uh, elected to be a uh, voter and a delegate to the uh, MML convention. And I would really like to encourage, I haven't said this since I've been here, but I, I really would like to encourage everyone to get involved in Michigan Municipal League. It makes you a better council person. Uh, you can uh, run for uh, one of the trustees at the MML uh, and vice president or president of the, of the league uh, will also broaden your experience on uh, things that are going on in the, in the state. You get a kind of a, a leg up on a lot of the other communities when you do that. I was vice president of the league when I was one of the, one of the years when I was uh, real active. I just retired from the league after 23 years, so uh, there's a hole there. Somebody needs to fill it. Uh, also a subset of the, of, of the league is the NBC Leo, uh, this Michigan Black Caucus local elected officials, which is a misnomer because anyone can belong to the uh, NBC Leo. I don't know if all of you or some of you know Jeff Jenks, He's very active in NBC Leo. So, uh, but I would really encourage you to uh, be active. You can bring a lot of things back to Southfield and be ahead of the game for a lot of communities because you find out a lot of things. And you also get to uh, have uh, input to some of the things that go up to the legislature. So, uh, and I'm going to close with that, that uh, just be more active and uh, just outside of Southfield. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, too, want to thank and congratulate the clerk's office on, a, on an election. Well done. Um, one more to go for the year. Um, I also want to remind everyone that this Wednesday in the front lawn is a rec, uh, Parks and Rec is hosting a Park It Outdoor movie. Um, it will not just be a movie, but from six to nine in the, in the, front, in the front lawn. Um, they're gonna have something for everyone. They're gonna have some live music. They're gonna have inflatable bounce houses, hot dogs, lemonade carts, and snacks available for purchase. And then they will have an outdoor movie that will begin around uh, 8.20, bring your own chair, blanket, and probably some bug spray. Also on Wednesday, August 23rd is our Senior Appreciation Night. That will be, again, Wednesday, August 23rd from 6 to 8 here in the front lawn. Uh, so that's next week, Wednesday. And they will have live entertainment with Motor City Soul. They'll have a box dinner, community vendors, and it's all free for seniors 50 and up. So I believe all of us out here don't, don't meet that criteria. <laughs> Um, other than that, have a, um, have a good evening, everyone, and we'll turn it over to the mayor. Good evening once again. Um, well, <laughs> Councilman uh, Brightwell, uh, I appreciate uh, how much you notice the improvements in the lobby. Really, it's a lot of work that goes into it, um, and uh, particularly uh, Dolores Flagg, our, our commission chair, uh, heads that up. 
So I invite all of you to uh, this Friday evening from 6.30 to 8.30 uh, is our artist reception for the latest uh, group of artists that are out there. Uh, this is a very diverse gr uh, group of people. Uh, the theme of the um, reception is Beyond Borders. And um, we'll have refreshments and introduction of the uh, artists that are represented in the lobby uh, for the next three months. Um, I also um, want to comment that we had a highly successful Kimmy Horn Jazz Festival this weekend. Um, Friday was a challenge. We had to end early because of tornado warning. Uh, and so we uh, missed Frida Payne. But um, Saturday uh, came roaring back, a little rain uh, around uh, 1.30 or so. But uh, uh, I believe we had over 4,000 people on the lawn. It, w it was packed here uh, on uh, s Saturday. People just kept coming and coming and coming. Um, so once again, a, a great event, and uh, thank you to uh, our Parks and Rec Department. Uh, thank you uh, to Public Works. Uh, thank you um, to the police and fire departments, um, and uh, Justin Beck, our emergency uh, uh, manager for the overall safety plan. I'm very pleased to report that there were absolutely no incidents whatsoever. Not, no one even, you know, a couple times we've had people maybe trip or something. Nothing um, uh, uh, transpired that required anyone's um, emergency attention. And uh, it, was, it was a great event. Uh, and then finally, uh, some very good news. Uh, as you know, um, we need more subsidized senior housing. And you may have seen the announcement uh, by the governor last uh, Thursday that our John Grace project has gotten the nod from MISHTA. Uh, we expect the conversion of the school uh, uh, that work to begin uh, in the spring. Uh, it'll be 18 uh, units uh, in the school converted to uh, subsidized senior apartments and then the addition of uh, 40, uh, no, wait, 42 uh, units in a new addition on the property and then uh, the pocket park, about an acre pocket park will be there. So we're extremely pleased. Um, there, this is our th third attempt to get the, the funding in place. So third time is a charm. Uh, I think we strengthened our application each time uh, we submitted. And we're extremely um, pleased because we know um, our, the three buildings that we have, McDonald Tower, River Park Place, and Woodbridge have waiting lists. So we know there's a, a demand uh, for subsidized senior housing. And perhaps um, Administrator Zorn will have a few other things to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. City Administrator. Yep. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll uh, add uh, just a few remarks regarding the John Grace Arms. We're excited to see it funded. The uh, press release indicated that uh, a tax credit allocation of one million three hundred and uh, three hundred and five uh, one million three hundred thousand uh, five hundred dollars, and that's over a ten-year period. So that's really uh, a thirteen million dollar investment from the state. You get ninety percent of that as you sell that. The project represents a fourteen point three million dollar investment in the city. So we're excited. The mayor, uh, as he said, we have waiting lists for senior affordable housing. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, rental subsidies on these, so our absorption will be as quick as we can get them built. We're very excited about that. Major an investment in the John Grace neighborhood. If you'll recall, we relocated our career center 
oh, about six years ago uh, from, from the school. It's been sitting empty. Uh, so it'll be nice to see it util uh, utilized. That's a neighborhood where we spent a little over six and a half million dollars rebuilding infrastructure since 2014. We recently finished uh, repaving Chiawasi as well as putting in a path. So we've been investing in this part of the city for a while and that was part of the story we told. I was fortunate enough last week to attend the uh, National uh, EPA uh, Brownfield Conference sponsored by the International City Managers Association. The conference was held at uh, Huntington Place, over 3,000 people. Um, stories like what we're doing with John Grace were what the things people were looking at. Combining the restoration and adaptive reuse of a building coupled with <coughs> low income housing tax credits. It's a good story and we should be proud as a community. I want to thank council for your help in getting us there. A couple other partners in this, Oakland County is committing some uh, resources. Right now they've committed a million dollars from their housing trust and the um, Southfield Brownfield Authority is committing uh, another million dollars towards the interior demolition, uh, lead abatement and asbestos abatement, all bringing in multiple funding sources to make this project happen. Uh, part of that EPA uh, conference, uh, we were able to show off our Northland project. Let's tell you, um, myself, Alice Sevis, and Terry Crowd presented to an audience of about 200 people. Um, the m a morning uh, session was followed by a tour with Mayor uh, Siver and uh, David uh, Duvakai from uh, Contours uh, giving a tour, very well received. Uh, you know, one of the stats I gave during the presentation is the United States has seven times <laughs> the amount of retail space per capita in comparison to Western Europe. With the Amazon world, we have more malls that are gonna be shutting. And the stat is about one, one mall is being going down every 10 days. So the world is watching what we're doing here. If you haven't been by, the uh, first building is going through the interior uh, build out, drywall, a quartz counter, you know, the, counter, the quartz countertops have been delivered, windows are in, the second building's going up, foundations for buildings, Three, four, and five will happen this fall. Uh, roads are being cut in, and on the west end, the Costco walls have started to go up. So we've, we've got uh, an exciting project ha happening there. I want to comment on storm damage. Uh, we've been intensely involved in cleanup. The storms that hit uh, in late July, uh, parts of the city, uh, in particular, uh, just um, west of Evergreen and south of Nine Mile was hit very hard. Our own park, Barbaric Park, we probably had $80,000 in tree removal costs. We brought in a private contractor who we have under contract for emergency. But I uh, drive down the, the streets, you'll see you know, how bad and hard that neighborhood was hit. Homes, uh, trees cut in half, trees landed on homes, trees crushed cars. Uh, so we've been, we continue to work in the, in the cleanup. The whole city was hit pretty hard, but that neighborhood seems to have gotten the hardest. Um, so I'm asking that people be patient. We have three crews out uh, chipping trees. We also have Michigan uh, Property Network, our private contractor still out uh, cleaning up and picking up. We are working with those homeowners who are eligible for assistance through our tree loan program, as well as our uh, SHIP program to see if, if people who are income eligible uh, for, for assistance. Uh, we've started work at Carpenter Lake. It is closed down. Uh, it's one of those, pardon our dust, but we have such a large renovation project and the popularity of that park merited shutting it down. Uh, Miller Park is looking real good. Basketball nets are up, tennis nets. I encourage you to swing by. Uh, I thank council for your patience there. Sims Park, uh, I was by there last Thursday. Every time I drive by there, I see people walking and utilizing the park. And Civic Center Park, we finished the tennis courts early in July, as well as the 
um, playing structure out in the uh, behind the pavilion here. So those investments that we've made are, are coming uh, forward. Parks and Rec will be planning a day of kind of ribbon cuttings is what we're discussing. So I'm asking council to stay, stay tuned. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A lot of things going on in the city for the, for the better. Um, Madam Attorney? I don't have any, excuse me, good evening. I have nothing further to add. All right, thank you. Madam Clerk? I just wanted to take the opportunity to, one, uh, thank my staff uh, in the clerk's office for uh, facilitating a successful election administration. And not just my staff, but the legions of inspectors and volunteers that are a part of this program and that make these happen. Um, I had the opportunity to go to uh, South Africa some years ago and talk with people who waited for days and walked for miles for the opportunity to vote. So to the 16% of people who voted, I want to say thank you so very much, but I want to admonish my community and the rest of my fellow Americans that this is a value that you have and you should be using it. And so I'm looking forward to us being on CNN because we will be the first community that has a 100% voter participation in the next election. I challenge you to encourage your children, your neighbors, your friends, and all of the other Americans who have this, hold this right precious um, to, to meet that challenge. And so thank you very much. Thank you. Did you want to speak on the, for the treasurer as well? Um, taxes are due at the end of the month. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. City planner? Nothing to add. City assessor's not here. I see our city engineer, but nothing to add. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, Mr. Pr you wrote projects. Why don't you just do a quick recap? <laughs> Put you on the spot. There's quite a bit happening. And Having just signed invoices, we've got a lot of stuff in design and out for construction again this year. How many million, Lee? More than I know off the top of my head. So we've got a lot in the works, and then we have um, projects that are under construction currently. The um, Twickingham, Twickingham Valley project, that project is actually out for bids right now, so at the next council meeting, that'll be the last um, project that I plan to award this construction season. Um, currently, Sharon Meadows is under construction. We've had a lot of work going on there. I shared with council the Road Commission's notice about Greenfield, southbound Greenfield, south of 10 Mile. Um, with that project, they're gonna do the first couple hundred feet of Mount Vernon right there off of Greenfield. <laughs> it's just a really bad spot right there, so I appreciate the Road Commission working with us um, to be able to include that with the project. Um, <clears throat> Tanglewood, we're really, that was a project more from last year, still working through restoration challenges there. Um, that will, we should be in a good spot um, this fall once we get through another growing season. So just working on a lot of weed control. The stuff they uh, planted early this spring and then we had that dry May just kind of gave us a bad start this year, but uh, the contractor's been continuing to uh, work on that out there. And For Washington Heights and Denzel. Denzel like currently is under construction. That's been going very smoothly. Um, we are looking to move forward with, um, well, we're under design, just got authorization. We're going to try and do a change order to the Denso Drive project to use the rest of that grant money to um, rebuild Foster Winter Drive. That's just west of Greenfield, south of Nine Mile. Um, Providence does use Foster Winter as, as their uh, emergency entrance there as well. Um, Washington Heights is the next project that is 
that's the one that's out for bids right now is Washington Heights. Twickingham, you already saw. So Twickingham, we just got those contracts fully executed. The contractor just today signed the notice to proceed. So we'll have a pre-construction meeting for Twickingham coming up here in the next week. And, um, and then it's Washington Heights. So Washington Heights, south of 10 Mile, northeast of Northwestern Highway. That's a really big project area. A lot of that work will continue into 2024, but looking forward to um, getting the water main replaced there, road improvements, and a lot of drainage improvements in that neighborhood as well. They've got some road flooding issues every time we have big rains like this. So we'll be addressing all of those. So, and then have some things. We've got some um, outside funding that we're still setting up where we're going to um, be spending some extra dollars that we expect to be allocated to Southfield from the state, some earmarks. So it'll be nice working on some final decision making there, see how far the dollars can take us on some of the roads that really need work that we have a hard time getting um, funding for otherwise. So you opened up a can of worms, but with this extra funding, because I told my neighbor I would bring it up the next time I saw you, because mm -hmm. every time I walk by his house, I get an air full. Lincoln Road. <laughs> do we know, is there gonna be enough of this extra funding for that, or do we have a, I know it's on the future map, but is that the foreseeable future? I'm not sure exactly where we are on Lincoln, other than we are, we just had a meeting with Lathrop Village, um, they, part of Lincoln Drive, we share that jurisdiction with the city of Lathrop Village, and we were talking with them about a potential grant opportunity um, to do some non-motorized and connection from Lincoln into the municipal campus, and we wanted to bring Lathrop Village into that. That just helps us score better to have a second community involved with that. Um, that's still very preliminary um, reviews, but we're thinking if we could do some on-street bike lanes, then that may help us be able to get some funding to incorporate road work for that stretch, at least between uh, Greenfield and, well, really, that's the whole the stretch course. of Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. if, if I may, Mr. President, when the infrastructure bill was passed last year, there was money for neighborhoods that were divided by freeways coming in. You might think of what's happening in downtown Detroit, uh, 375 and, and the redesign. In this case, there were some recent changes in the legislation again that Lincoln, uh, because when 696 came through, that we may be able to go after that funding. And that's the meeting Ms. Schultz is, is mentioned. There's also a look at 11 Mile. When, the, when 696 came through, cut off whole neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and it went Lincoln up to 696. So we're seriously taking a, a look at that. And these are competitive dollars, but the message to the community is we're continuing to find money wherever we can and knock on whatever doors we can. And, We'll c continue to do that. What we usually need from council is the authorization on pre-engineering and evaluation. Looking at these programs takes, takes time. Uh, we're fortunate that both of our engineering consultants have picked up recent retirees from MDOT, individuals who are very familiar with how to secure these dollars, and we're tapping them. Lincoln tells a good story to fit that specific grant that we're looking at, so we've got, we think it could be a very nice application that we could take the lead on and then work with Lathrop Village. They're looking to rebuild their portion of Lincoln anyway, so they are setting aside dollars to move forward with some work there, so it would be nice if we can make that all happen together. Yeah, because I, I, I'll keep mentioning it, you know, in front of all the schools that you have there as well, there could mm -hmm. be either some expansion or uh, left turn lanes or so something because that, when, when all the schools are coming and going, it sometimes gets very backed up. Okay. So, but we can talk about that once we know further what's going on. Okay. Um, Councilman Taylor? Yes, while, while I have you, uh, Lee, could you provide us any updates on the lawn um, replacement because of um, right there on Aberdeen near uh, Catalpa, 
and all of that, you know, the neighbors, right. they were growing weeds instead of grass. Yeah, that's the Tanglewood subdivision that I mentioned. So that we are definitely still working on the weed control and they do some overseeding. So, and you know, I'm not the landscape expert, but there's a certain number of weeks that they have to go by. They'll do some overseeding and then they have to wait usually two weeks before they can come in and do another weed and feed. Um, the residents now are responsible to do that mowing. Mm -hmm. Some residents have been mowing the area, some have not. Our contract did include two mowings. Um, our contractor has fulfilled that mowing obligation, so um, keeping the weeds mowed down is, will help control them from spreading, mm -hmm. and it will be easier to get the grass to reestablish and control that weed spread. Thank you. All right, Councilman Banks. Thank you. Did you say that the um, extra funding could also be used for bike paths? Um, the, this particular grant that is a strong application, there are different grants. I mean, we've been successful in getting some of these um, bike path type grants. So uh, I work with the planning department pretty closely too when these opportunities come up to see, okay, where's you know, here's the new round of grants, where's the next place we may want to spend some, you know, our match dollars to fill a gap where we don't have those facilities, so. No, I mean the road, the extra, mo the road funding, the extra money. It speaks to complete streets, so whether Lincoln Road, 11 Mile, it's not just the streets in this case and the other road projects, but it also speaks to the other components of a complete street, and that is your pedestrian uh, amenities that the sidewalk is along the streets. No, uh, I, I think prior. What, I think what Councilman Banks is asking is it was mentioned that we have additional funding for this year. Is that can that be used for um, bike paths? C correct. Yeah, the extra funding isn't specifically for this year. Um, it's supposed to be in the state's budget that that they pass for this upcoming fiscal year. You're talking dental now, right? Well, beyond Denzo, the, from your efforts in right. Lansing. Yeah, um, Den Denzo is pretty much for the streets. And yeah, the, that the was for the this The other year. five million will come <clears throat> to us uh, in October. Uh, and that'll come similar to the Denzo funds. 50% will come in. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm estimating six weeks after the state starts its fiscal year. Any other questions for our engineer? All right, Mr. Zern, you were in the middle. I'm sorry, we cut no, you off. I, about the last thing is you might, I don't know if they've started, but we started staking for the new trees to come in too. So you down to the Civic Center, you'll see where we staked and new trees should be going in in the next week or two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have nothing to schedule. Our next is our closed session. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that we go into closed session Board. to to discuss. <laughs> Jump the gun. To, to discuss the disclosure by state or federal statute pursuant to the Michigan Open Meetings Act, uh, MCL 15.268, Section H. Specifically, a written legal opinion pursuant to Public Act 442, MCL 15.2431G, information or record subject to the attorney client privilege. All right, it has been moved by Councilman Taylor, supported by Councilman Brightwell, to go into a closed session for discussion of materials exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute, MCL. 15.268H and MCL 15.2431G, information or records subject to the attorney client privilege. Uh, Madam Clerk, we need a roll call vote. Uh, Council Member Taylor. Yes. Council Member Brightwell. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Council Member Frazier. Yes. Council Member Holly. Yes. Council President Madigan. Yes. Council Member Blake. Yes. <clears throat> All right, we will adjourn or we will move to the room next door for our closed session.